And we are live. This is Dark Journalist. Uh, what a fantastic crowd we have out there in the ideas room tonight already. Of course, tonight I am joined by the lovely Olivia. Hi, everybody. And uh, Olivia, life is real only then when I am. Mm, what does that mean? What's the original title to Gurdjieff's? tale to his grandson. Um, interestingly enough, the latter released upon Gurdjieff's death, but started in 1926, all about spending all this time in a spacecraft hovering above Earth and visiting it at interesting times. And we're getting into that tonight. Tonight is Gurdjieff Saves the 21st Century. Enneagram, Food for the Moon, it's all revealed here way teachings of P.I. Gurdjieff and the mystery schools. Very interesting also, I should say, which is um, although there's a number of movements that hit very heavy in the early 20th century, the Gurdjieff movement is very unusual. And uh, you can look at it and say it comes from a different strand of the mystery schools, wherever they were coming from. They're very body-oriented and um, they cut off uh, certain types of you know, certain types of line um, that were very, very popular in the period of revelation coming right after Blavatsky and with everything that was going on with um, Casey and all that. So there's not much mention of things like um, reincarnation, but instead we have recurrence. <laughs> And um, it's quite fascinating. It's almost a reaction against theosophy in some ways. And um, all of these movements, in fact, set up to get us into a situation where we are uh, completely now in the period that it was built for, which is the early 20th, uh, 21st century. And so that 100-year span really has us moving in the right direction. So here we are with Gurdjieff Saves the 21st Century, how is that possible? Well, I'm going to show you how uh, the teaching laid out by Gurdjieff is a direct response to the things that are happening here. And uh, we, uh, <laughs> I know we had uh, a little sound clip. It seems uh, that's the way that the show starts, but I think it's all good now. Um, one of the things I also want to point out is that we're going to look into here tonight is... Uh, there's a lot of strange news going on just around, so I've decided to do a special report just on, for example, Trump as Speaker, <laughs> RF Kennedy uh, going solo and independent there. Uh, October 9th is his big announcement that he's going, quote, independent. Well, he always really was, let's face it, but um, you know, with this Democratic Party, they left him a long, long time ago, but he was giving them a fair run for their money doing things. And uh, for me, he, you know, one of the announcements that's going to be critical is, has he decided to run independently with that kind of a network, setting up ballot by ballot state access, or is it the libertarians and him getting together? And is he running in that direction? Um, the libertarians already have access in all 50 states, and that would be a very, very major uh, move on his part. Uh, there's no question there's going to be a lot of independent activity. There's something else called the No Labels Party, and what they were trying to do uh, was run Joe Manchin, who likes to talk a good conservative game and then folds over and over again to Biden. Uh, he's the West Virginia Democrat, and uh, there have been a lot of rumors about him switching parties to the Republican Party. So there's a lot of strange things that I think are in the works because um, what they have with Stepford Biden up there is that he, you know, as we saw today, is not capable of doing a press conference. And he's reached a kind of a critical um, portion where I don't think he can last a year um, for the whole election running into next November. So they're obviously working very hard in the background to figure out how to replace him. Although uh, if they could you know, just kind of conveniently keep him around with that board controlling him in the background, the committee, <laughs> presidency by committee, as we've seen. Uh, that then, sounds so Soviet. It is, no question about it. 
And for me, I mean, uh, you know, it's quite fascinating also the way that things have gone with Biden, because what we have is, you know, they never should have run him uh, in the first place. He was too old and um, he was already into a kind of a feeble thing. And it's interesting because at his age, 81, there's very dynamic people and all the rest, but Biden isn't one of them. <laughs> Neither mm -hmm. is Pelosi. Um, so this is a very interesting uh, situation. Of course, the whole uh, situation with throwing out the Speaker of the House and only eight Republicans doing this and the rest being Democrats. And uh, don't get me wrong, a lot of people are very happy to see Speaker McCarthy gone because he had caved on so many major issues and he had it coming. Um, but the idea of eight Republicans determining the whole thing for the Republican Party is kind of tough. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how that works out. What it opens up is an opportunity for President Trump to come in as a unifier and get behind one candidate. And uh, it looks like the one he's been getting behind is Jordan, although we'll see what kind of a ruckus that causes. Um, but Jordan is certainly preferable to McCarthy. So we'll see if this whole gambit of Gates and others works out. For my money, uh, all the talk about Trump being speaker is only a distraction from his own presidential campaign. The guy is up in every poll and he's getting attacked legally by the administration. Uh, you know, that whole pattern is just going to continue on. So I don't see there's, there's no real upside or benefit from Trump becoming speaker. You know, he's heading toward the presidency unless there's some grand plan in the background somehow but uh <laughs> it would be it would be amusing let's face it <laughs> <clears throat> a maria says it's a politically embarrassing time oh yeah well we're going to see a lot of structures crumble and this is really where the fourth way and um you know jg bennett pd Spensky, gi gurdjieff the whole wave of that mystery tradition coming forward spreading those seeds out and letting us know the period we're coming into. Interestingly enough, um, it is Bennett who over and over again focused on 2020. And when you think about, you know, the whole COVID psyop and everything that they were pulling hardcore in 2020 and everything about that, you can see that from his vantage point where he was, he was looking out across time and seeing this. That is... <laughs> Trump with the gavel there. Uh, and, you know, we might see it mm -hmm. because they, in the meantime, they certainly need, uh, you know, some kind of a unification there in the House to get behind the right candidate because you still have a lot of rhinos in the Congress. You have people who aren't completely Jim Jordan type people. And uh, so it's, it's kind of hard. And you can't let the Democrats who actually contributed to the chaos. It's the only thing I don't like about the vote that got McCarthy out is you had 210 some odd Democrats joining with just a few Republicans. That means, Hey, we're going to enable this chaos. So, uh, we'll see if they regret doing that as well. A little, uh, a few things that came up, which we'll get to before we dig in here on Gurdjieff saves the 21st century. And I want to remind you before we go any further that, um, we're going to be taking your questions in part two of tonight's program. And you can ask those uh, of Miss Olivia now mm -hmm. and sort of keep uh, keep all that going. And then in the second half of the program, she will put those together and ask. And before I go any further, Miss Olivia, what do you got? Uh, Dixie 504 says the story of G DJT as speaker is a wonderful way to troll the Uniparty. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, it's a fun news story. I don't know how practical it is, but yeah, it does. <laughs> they had those, uh, the memes of him sitting behind Biden during the state of the union. You can only imagine the tension coming down on the, the zombie like Biden. Um, someone else came out and put her two cents in and that was Hillary Clinton. And she said, deprogramming deplorables. Clinton raises the need for formal deprogramming of Trump supporters. <laughs> how do you like that? Thank you, Eva Braun. Uh, so a little 1984 action from our good friend, Hillary. And it is very strange. A number of people have commented on it also, which is the same week that Bill Clinton came out and made a, a sensible comment, which was, oh, you know, we can't let all these migrants in, right? Bill Clinton, who always knew, uh, you know, as corrupt as he was, he always knew the political pulse. Here she comes up with another tone deaf. She's just the opposite of Bill in this sense which is she's a terrible, one of the worst politicians we've ever had come down the pike. 
Former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton has caused another stir by suggesting that millions of Trump supporters may require a formal deprogramming. <laughs> well, uh, that's pretty interesting, Madam Secretary. It was a moment clearly enjoyed by CNN's Christian Amapour, who previously suggested the FBI should have stopped Trump from making certain campaign statements. I mean, these people, you know, uh, they live in a security, national security state uh, daydream, and mm. they just, that's all that they want. You know, so it's kind of 1984 Stasi state. But I think with Hillary and that whole uh, train that she's on, you know, she's a very dangerous individual uh, in that sense. And we're very lucky that for all the efforts in 2016, the alternative media and others, got in a totally different candidate for better, for worse. And, uh, for me, it, it seems very likely that, uh, looking at something going forward there where they're trying to develop a theme. Um, and this is Jonathan Turley who was making some very, very astute, uh, there's a couple of guys out there, judge Napolitano, Jonathan Turley, a few others who are making very astute legal comments about everything that's going on. And Turley, you know, no, no fan of the Republicans by nature, <laughs> but he can see all the things that are going on uh, with the regime. And he says, my concern over the common is less whether Hillary Clinton is serious. I don't know. I'm more concerned by the continued reckless rhetoric from national leaders. And uh, that's really what it's about because they want this. They, they love this kind of showdown feeling. Uh, a little more here, which <laughs> this is great too, and it's Noam Chomsky, you know, who wrote Manufacturing Consent and all this other stuff, and who I always felt was suspect. He's over here about 10 minutes from us at MIT. And uh, he, one of the things that he never would cover were the Kennedy assassinations, the crux of history, the modern history we're living in. That was always very suspect to me. Anyone who knew history to the level that he did and, uh, you know, he really just blew it off and was like, oh, I'm not doing it. But anyway, um, here he has this thing. Now it's fight disinformation. Yes. Fight it when people are, you know, getting out of the COVID psyop or whatever it happens to be. And now, uh, you know, the, the man who created manufacturing consent is now saying, you know, learn to censor other people. So we're in a weird time that way where, you know, it really is the world gone upside down. And uh, we're going to see a lot more of it as we go. I'm sure of that. Now, uh, David Axelrod, he of the Obama campaign, uh, he of the Bernie Sanders uh, campaign, he's been somebody very, very deep in that Democratic establishment and a total Obama flag waver, Biden flag waver. And... This is very interesting. So just before we came on tonight, he posts rumors circulating that Elon Musk and others may be throwing into a super PAC for the independent bid of RFK Jr., who's announcing next week. If true, it could be a significant factor in shaping the outcome of the 2024 race. That's a kind of an earthquake coming from his side of things. And also Musk, if Musk is going forward and doing that, throwing in behind RFK uh, this would be gigantic on a number of levels. We'll see if that's actually true, but that's something uh, that I can confirm he at least put on the record. We'll see if it comes to pass. Something going on there behind the scenes, and right along this line, uh, the SEC just uh, announced that they're going in deep now in a legal case against Elon. Why? Because he bought Twitter, and they want to know all the details. So that gives you some idea. What do you think of that? Interesting. Ray J says, who got to Chomsky? What did he do to get compromised? Oh, I think he was compromised anyway, but this is like a different level of compromise. This is like, I can't even do the charade anymore. <laughs> um, well, he was on the Lolita Express, right? He went to the Epstein Island. Well, I don't know if that's so much Chomsky's, but he may have been, but mm -hmm. what's uh, a, a few kind of you know, telltale giveaways, I think, with Chomsky were. <laughs> Everybody, everybody's like, Epstein, Epstein. <laughs> uh, a few things with him. Uh, you know, he's had this thing where, you know, he's spoken out against the deep state. You know, he doesn't call him the deep state, but just, you know, that imperialist American uh, encroaching on Iraq 
Afghanistan and all the rest. So he's he's been on the right side uh, of saying these things. But you know what it comes down as you know he he also on the COVID op he jumped in and was like a big supporter of the regime on that. Um, you know, and the glossing over. Uh, you know, for example, the MLK assassination. I mean, how can you be even considered a historian and, and blow that off as anything other than completely suspicious, especially in terms of, you know, the president being assassinated just before that and then the president's brother also getting assassinated two months apart from MLK. You just leave that out of history. <laughs> uh, you know, for me, Chomsky is one of those people who had the ability and the intellect to do it, but he had a very comfortable spot over there at MIT. And I'm sure they would have thrown him out, you know, <laughs> and I think that's the thing. Um, so we're going to, you know, we're going to ride it out in terms of the politics that are going on right now, but we, we're going to do some kind of special report probably right after Bobby announces uh, in Philadelphia, and this should be pretty major what he has coming up there. I'm actually looking forward to this, but he's coming up here to Boston uh, closer to the end of the month to do something similar so the whole month is going to be packed with uh, a lot of heavy coverage on that front. But as I told you, this is Mystery October. And that means we dig in deep on the mystery schools. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing tonight with Gurdjieff Saves, the 21st Century Enneagram, Food for the Moon, and the Fourth Way Revealed. This is a very important uh, episode for a number of reasons. But um, for me, there's a lot in the Gurdjieff work, which has not been explored, very much like the Steiner work and, of course, the Atlantean aspects of the Casey work. <laughs> so, um, you know, and there's no way to, to fault the organizations that put out their material. This is just a fact of history over time. You know, uh, people die, you know, uh, the people who pick up the torch are not as dynamic the, and the times have changed. And so there's a number of different factors that go on. The thing about the mystery school work that we get in uh, through anthroposophy in the fourth way and Casey's work is that it, it was looking forward. It was a tool for us to kind of deal with the era that is approaching. And so they're very unusual and unique in this way. And there's a kind of a timelessness over and over again when you go back to that work they have their different phases and they even show up at different times uh, in popular, you know, uh, media. But you, know, you think about something like the Enneagram, for example, <laughs> that at a certain point in the early 2000s, they had Enneagram board games and stuff. <laughs> and, you know, they had a whole series of books, which was about guess your type, which is all Gurdjieff stuff. Uh, and it's funny too, when we get into looking at the Enneagram because it's a crucial aspect that Gurdjieff brought forward. But very often uh, when the Enneagram's talked about, Gurdjieff's not even mentioned because there have been these groups that co-opt or astroturf the whole thing. And, um, you know, that whole thing, uh, Oscar Acaso and all that stuff, what they, there's a whole piece to this, which is they wanted to be able to uh, go forward and, you know, study these things and put books out and stuff without paying any kind of residual to the Gurdjieff Foundation. So what did they say? They were like, oh yeah, well, we just found all this Gurdjieff research in the middle of a South American mystery school and here it all, you know, so this was, this is a function of it, but let's, let's be very clear that it's Gurdjieff who brings forward the Enneagram and what he ascribes to it in terms of its important, we'll get into tonight but this is a crucial piece that I think is still not quite understood <laughs> out there. Um, and the depth, I think, that's suggested in the Enneagram. Uh, you know, Gurdjieff suggesting that if two people meet from different mystery schools, if they draw the Enneagram, then the other one will know which level the other one is on. So, you know, I can easily tell who's more advanced out of the two. That's pretty significant. Um, and there's just a number of things that are built into that. But Gurdjieff in particular, leaving us the opus of Beelzebub's Tales to his grandson, which has to be like, you know, the kind of Ulysses <laughs> of, its, uh, of its genre, because it's so difficult in a way, in a sense, to understand. And yet there's so much of it that opens up to us, including the fact that 
Beelzebub's on a spaceship, including the fact that Beelzebub goes back to Atlantis, including uh, that Beelzebub basically is translating all the things that Gurdjieff has been teaching over time. And at the time that he's writing, and he starts in 1926, but it doesn't come out till 1950 upon his death. Um, but he doesn't realize that Ospensky has written a whole book about him that's going to come out upon Ospensky's death. And when he dies uh, in 1947, the book comes out a year later, and Gurdjieff gets the book, and he's like, this is incredible. This is everything that I did with that whole group. Ospensky got it down to a T. And <laughs> the reason that's so remarkable is that Gurdjieff, you know, had, there was incredible hostility towards Ospensky and Gurdjieff toward the end of their engagement. But there's no question that Ospensky was the one who brought to the Western world the teachings of Gurdjieff because uh, it is in search of the miraculous that's basically the touchstone of the entire work. That book is remarkable, and I'll tell you, if you go back into it just a little bit, you're going to find that its original title is Fragments of an Unknown Teaching. Now, this tells us a great deal about it. Think about that. First of all, it is frag it's fragments of things. And there's a hole there that is so powerful, but he's he's got these pieces from Gurdjieff. And then again, it's an unknown teaching. This doesn't have anything in common with you know, ascended masters. It doesn't have anything in common with the Akashic records. You know, it's, it's different. It's something else. And um, when we look into it that way, we can start to see there's a different strain that was out there. And Gurdjieff himself alludes to it when he meets Ospensky. And Ospensky says, well, I just came back from all these travels from the East, and I went looking for these different schools as a matter of fact, the title In Search of the Miraculous comes from those lectures that Ospensky did in 1916. And it's a great title for a book, actually. It's better than Fragments, but Fragments is more telling about what the book is actually giving us. Um, and what we get there uh, in the setup of Gurdjieff and Ospensky is we're in Russia just before major war breaks out. The war is, is happening but the Russian, Russian Revolution has not taken place yet. It's incredibly tense. And uh, Ospensky is a journalist, and he is, you know, he writes all these political things and everything else, but he decides at a certain point around 1911 to go over to India and Tibet and these other places to try to see if he can find these mystery schools. No knowledge of Gurdjieff, nothing. And Gurdjieff is nowhere uh, in the sea of all this. He's not publicly visible at all. In fact, Ospensky has written a book and is already a best-selling author. He wrote Tertia Morganum, which gets him a big audience in England and in the U.S. when it's published. And um, this is a fascinating book and is pure Ospensky, you know, before the Gurdjieff involvement, before he adopted the Gurdjieff system. And I think it's a very important to look at that book and The Strange Life of Ivan Osikin, which is his novel about recurrence, which basically became the foundation for Groundhog Day, which is the Bill Murray movie. Uh, I know you like that one, mm -hmm. <laughs> Olivia. Um, but it is, you know, th that's a big, the recurrence theme is major with Ospensky. But Ospensky has all sorts of psychic experiences growing up. And in fact, the person he quotes the most often in Tertia Morganum is Helena Blavatsky. So he's more connected with that. And when he's talking about, you know, in the beginning of In Search of the Miraculous, he's sitting there working at this newspaper. He opens his desk drawer and there is a book on Atlantis by Rudolf Steiner. You can see what he's uh, sort of tapped into. So it's a, it's a quite a, uh, a change when he meets Gurdjieff. And then that is a whole different kind of a thing that builds up. And he meets him through a sculptor that he knows. But weird things happen along the way. He sees an ad uh, for something called The Struggle of the Magicians. And this is a ballet that's supposedly this. Oh, this is what a great this, title. Yeah, this very strange, you know, Eastern master has written this ballet. And it's got all these movements and things that no one's ever seen. And there's a huge hype. And the ad is in the newspaper that he's running and uh, he's writing for. 
and it's quite fascinating because that ballet <laughs> never happens. And it's just some kind of a thing to draw people in. And it turns out that, um, you know, this sculptor that Ospensky knows, knows Gurdjieff, who's the person who's putting on this ballet. And he says, well, you know, you just went looking for mystery schools. This guy came out of a mystery school. Do you want to meet him? And Gurdjieff uh, and Ospensky have this interesting meeting where Gurdjieff invites him to a very noisy, difficult to talk place. And he sits him down at the bar and Gurdjieff is using what Ospensky says is this Caucasian, heavy Caucasian accent, which I, I gather is the same as like speaking like you're from the Bronx or something. Mm -hmm. And he's intentionally trying to turn Ospensky off so that Ospensky, if he has it's kind of superficial, oh, like, you know, I'm too much of an intellectual to deal with this guy. And here he is, you know, inviting me into these crowded circumstances. I can't hear him. It's difficult to deal with. He, you know, he has this heavy accent. What's interesting is later, uh, you know, Gurdjieff speaks perfect Russian and everything else. So this was a put on. And uh, Ospensky makes it through and he realizes he starts to see, oh, like Gurdjieff is kind of in disguise. And so this is how the whole relationship opens up. And so what Ospensky says is, you know, I want to learn everything about what you're doing and I want to become one of your students. My only condition is I want to be able to write about everything. And Gurdjieff said, that's fine. Just wait until you understand the whole thing before you write about it. And so that's the agreement that they make. And at first, you know, it's interesting, their conversation is a little strained because Gurdjieff says to him, well, you know, if you understood, uh, if, you know, your book is fantastic, this Tertium Organum book. And if you were to, you know, understand everything that you wrote in that book, I would bow down to you as a master right now. But you don't understand either what you wrote or uh, what the ideas are that you're talking about. So he basically takes him down a peg dramatically. Interestingly enough, if you go into that history a little bit, um, it's clear that Gurdjieff had spotted out Ospensky earlier and had decided this is the guy who's going to bring forward things. So he's arranged things in the background to get uh, Ospensky in the picture. And it's going to be basically the stroke of genius <laughs> for Gurdjieff life. And you have to think about Gurdjieff, somebody who does a lot of self-sabotage as, as much as he's really, you know, this advanced master and everything else. One of the the greatest things that he did was making Ospensky his student. Everyone, you're watching The Dark Journalist, Gurdjieff saves the 21st century. This is X series episode 159, going deep on the Enneagram, Food for the Moon, and uh, the fourth way teaching, how it relates to this period of transformation that we're facing. We're going to take your questions in part two of tonight's program. Miss Olivia is putting those together now as we speak. And it's good to have so many of you here with us. Uh, this Mystery October, you're going to find a lot of very interesting uh, episodes here. And they're all going to have a theme of going just one level deeper uh, when it comes to the mystery subjects. And I think it's it's kind of perfect timing with everything that's going on. Miss mm -hmm. uh, Olivia, before I go any further, what do you got? Okay. Uh, Guitar Malade wants to know, Enneagram, what is the definition and Nancy O'Brien Simpson says, what Enneagram number is the dark one? I think that means you. <laughs> I, you know, do you know how many people have told me what number I was on the Enneagram? But it's interesting because the types thing is just one aspect of what the Enneagram's about. And we're going to get into, I have so much on the Enneagram here and boy, are we going to have fun with it? But <laughs> I'll tell you this. The first thing you need to know is that the Enneagram symbol was the symbol of the Sarmung Brotherhood where Gurdjieff got all of his uh, original knowledge. Now, there's a number of things about Sarmoon and Gurdjieff's story of it, which are in meetings with remarkable men, which basically could be seen as kind of his biopic. <laughs> but it's a book that he wrote about his experiences, and it shows, you know, and he worked, he had people around uh, who were very good, like A.R. Arash, and who's the person who coined the term the New Age, who was this brilliant um, British publisher, and these people helped him translate this vision, you know. But I will say, if you read Meetings with Remarkable Men, it's so easy to read. It, it's so fluid, and you can learn so much from it. But it's, you know, it's 
it's one of the best just stories following along his adventures as he's making it to this mystery school. Um, Plus so the movie's that, pretty good. The movie, yes. Um, Peter Brook made the movie, I think, in the 1982, somewhere in there. And he went to Afghanistan where, um, and this is interesting too. No, it must have been that he filmed it in 79 because he filmed it just before the big invasion uh, by the Soviet Union of Afghanistan. So he had access to all this. And um, some of those, you know, locations, Turkestan, Afghanistan, these were where the schools were that Gurdjieff went to, supposedly. But he was also very good at throwing off the track. So it's very hard to say exactly where the mystery schools were. At one point in the book, he shows up at the Essene Mystery School. Well, that's all fine and well, but the Essenes, you know, they, after uh, the esoteric order was set up for five, 600 years, and uh, Essene meant expectancy, and what they expected was the Messiah, and they went through all of these very major kind of esoteric tests to set that up, and then we have the appearance of Christ, and then the Essenes, you know, that kind of goes away. So it's not like there's an active Essene group. That's where the Dead Sea Scrolls come from. So what's going on there with Gurdjieff encountering them? And as there are a certain point when you're dealing with the mystery schools where time is, is no object. That is very interesting. And you find that a lot in meetings with remarkable men. My point with this, though, is there's something interesting because when you get to Beelzebub's tale, it's incredibly hard to read. <laughs> and it's loaded, you know, it, it's, it's full up. And what Gurdjieff has to say about it, I have some quotes that Gurdjieff made about it uh, on the record. So I'm going to read those tonight. But the book itself, let's say it gives so much information, but it intentionally is designed, you know, whereas let's say there were different movements and they wanted you to pick up terms like Kundalini, yoga, you know, and you learn these things. But then at a certain point, the information becomes mechanical. So Gurdjieff would put in these words like Kundalasa Lusa Lusa, you know, like you just could not <laughs> walk around at cocktail parties and throw these terms out. You'd have to go back and check whatever they were. And uh, this is done by design to make it very difficult to set into the mechanical mind these deep concepts. You'd have to keep reaching to something else. And um, so the book is an exercise in many ways. And uh, according to Gurdjieff, it contains all the teaching that he was able to bring in. So it, it's a powerful book. And I'm not knocking it by saying it's difficult to read, but uh, it just in normal terms, it is intentionally throwing you off the track over and over again. And it's interesting, you know, Ospensky, who had basically given up on Gurdjieff by that point when the book came out, he was, you know, beside himself to get the verse copy. And he said, it sticks in my throat. I can't, just, I can't get anything out of it. It's all symbolism. And, um, but I think going deeper with it, it's, it's loaded with information. We're going to get into some of that tonight. Um, I'm going to make a very interesting crisscross with Gurdjieff and Stalin tonight. Mm. <laughs> and this crisscross may have, it may have given Gurdjieff problems his whole life because uh, they, in fact, went to the same school. And there's an interest level of Stalin with Gurdjieff that may have put him on a number of different, you know, kind of blacklists when it came to different countries. So over and over again, Gurdjieff's in Gurd, he's in Germany, he's in the UK, and he's getting thrown out. He and his group are getting thrown out. And he finally lands in France. Um, and then later the Nazis invade. So he has a tough time the whole way through. And this is the interesting thing about setting up his version, you know, of the mystery schools, which he called the harmonious development of man or humanity. Um, this you know, harmonious development piece, the fourth way schools is under tremendous difficulty from its inception when he comes on the scene during World War I through the Russian Revolution, which almost destroys the whole thing. And then um, through, you know, the difficulties that he has after Spensky gets him, you know, Spensky introduces him to Western society and really brings him in. You know, he's getting him funding and everything else. And Gurdjieff manages to, kind of sabotage this situation over and over again. So by the time you get into Gurdjieff in America and the things that happen there, again, um, there's a lot of, 
you know, havoc. So I would say the story of the fourth way school is tension all the way through. And maybe that's what keeps it vital in that sense. The offshoots of the fourth way teaching are multitude and you can find, you know, I think it's one of the interesting things also about the fourth way schools is all the major uh, intellectuals of the period who are doing great writing like Aldous Huxley, Christopher Isherwood, um, you know, Gerald Hurd, Catherine Mansfield, Jane Heap, all these people are one gigantic uh, literary wave who are completely connected in the Gurdjieff tradition. So we have there, again, that mystery school influence, just like if you go back a little further, you find it um, in the Orphic circle, you know, you've got Dickens and you, you have all these people in theosophy, you have, um, you know, uh, the Golden Dawn and theosophy have all these incredible writers of the period. And so we have that connection again, when we get into the Gurdjieff period, he's influencing out through these different channels. And when you get to, um, you know, both Ospensky's and Gurdjieff student, J.G. Bennett, that's a legacy that takes us into the sixties and the seventies. And, you know, you have all these rock stars and people mm -hmm. who plug in you know, Robert Fripp <laughs> Uh, people like that who plug into Bennett's work. So there's there's a cultural connection all the way through, I would say, with the fourth way work. And it brings us into this period where I said, you know, once in a while you can catch things, whether it's from Steiner's work or from Gurdjieff's work, rising into popular culture, just like the Waldorf schools, you know, in certain circles are very popular. In fact, they have probably no idea about just how esoteric Steiner was, but um, you know, maybe maybe that's good. <laughs> maybe it's easier for them. Um, all right, a couple of things about Sarmung. There's a character named X in um, Meetings with Remarkable Men. His real name is Pagosian, but everything with Gurdjieff and names is code. It's funny because Bennett when he was trying to study these people as literal people, he came across a character in the book named Prince Lubavetsky. And Lubavetsky is someone who guides Gurdjieff to do all these different things. But the translation of the name Lubavetsky is love of knowledge. So therefore, Gurdjieff's not giving us his real name. He's giving him, you know, this title, basically. And throughout the book, you can find that. But one of the things that his group called the Seekers of Truth is going after is knowledge about these mystery schools that have disappeared, but there's like an underground channel. There's whispers that they still exist and that you can find them and that they were the ones who built Notre Dame and, you know, their knowledge goes all the way back to the Egyptian pyramids and everything else. Now, um, what he finds in a book, uh, Pogosian brings him a book and it has this unusual image in it, which is the symbol of the Sarmung group. Later, uh, when Gurdjieff comes to New York in 1924, he, one of the things he's going to lead with to the American audience is the same thing. He's going to bring in the Enneagram. Well, the Enneagram is the same symbol of the Sarmung Brotherhood, but it has this triangle in the middle, and that makes it nine, and that's where we get Ennea from. That's the Greek term for nine. Um, nobody knew anything. And I can tell you this, it's funny because I did a study on trying to find the Enneagram in works before Gurdjieff. There's only a mention of it in certain Christian, uh, doctrines, kind of secret Christian doctrines. One of those books that came out, which is very much like steganography of the period, um, is called Arithmologia. It's from 1665, and the name of the guy is Athanius Kircher, but you can see clearly uh, here we have this really kind of incredible image of the Enneagram, and there's a pyramid with an eye in it and the whole bit. So, um, Wow, hold that up a little bit longer. It's incredible. Yeah, and we'll take a look at it. I will. Um, what I will say about it is that you can't, you know, it's not like this was in currency and that there was, you know, stuff about it. There's so many things that are completely original in the Gurdjieff work. So when we get into it, um, you know, we have to keep that in mind, which is 
so many things that we find out about are derivative, but how many things are dead bang original? <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of originality in uh, Dr. Farrell's work, you know, Gigi Young, incredibly original work. A lot of the things we try to do in the X series, but really um, it's interesting when you look at all these different movements that were going on in the 20th century, you know, so much of the Alice Bailey stuff came directly out of Blavatsky's work and Elizabeth Clare Prophet comes, you know, bringing forward the I am type stuff, but in her own way with the unification, not unification, church universal triumphant. And it's very interesting. Don't get me wrong. But, um, it, you know, more and more, it seems like that original spark and source and it is, is kind of missing and they're carrying on some kind of legacy of it. When you come around to this period that we're in the 2020s here, there's, there's, uh, you can feel it just like in society, there's the kind of, uh, room for something being ignited. And as I've pointed out, um, Steiner predicted this is the period a door was opening here. And he said, you know, spiritual science, the door opens again in a hundred years. Well, he said it in 1920. So um, we look, we look at the period that we're in and then we see how do these things relate and how much did the things that were laid out really um, kind of, how much did the culture absorb them? This is what happens. And I think the best way we can understand these types of mystery schools or mystery teachings is that they they lay things out. And um, this is something that Bennett went to Gurdjieff about, like, you know, what kind of a society should we make with all this work? And Gurdjieff said, no, you know, it's not going to work that way. You're going to have small groups of people working in tandem. And he said, you know, the, the mystery schools work. They come forward, they spread seeds, and they see what happens with the seeds, and they retreat, they get out of the picture. So... You know, it's not like there's going to be the big mystery school foundation in the middle of it. Once in a while, we get lucky and we get public versions of this. And certainly uh, the fourth way, you know, and it's funny because a lot of people uh, bring up Gurdjieff and they're like, well, you know, he was temperamental. He blew everybody off. He, you know, and a lot of these people, um, all of them really they all have personality quirks because they're human beings and you're going to find them, you know, doing all kinds of things, you know, abusing power, <laughs> uh, you know, but it's because well, they come across tests, right. As part of their initiation. Exactly. Yeah. And like, they're not, you know, they're not always going to come up perfect, but you know, in general, uh, I'm going to tell you that when I researched Gurdjieff, if you really go into the people who worked with them, there's an incredible charitable streak. And one of the interesting things that Bennett said he had to do the whole time was there were lines and lines of different groups that would come to him in Paris and they were uh, different groups. They were different groups like Italians, uh, French, Jewish. They were the groups that would come to Gurdjieff and he would be the one bankrolling them for this or for that to keep them going. And they didn't, you know, the, these were very needy people and it's Gurdjieff there filling the void, trying to come to the rescue to some of these people. I remember there's a student of Gurdjieff's named Fritz Peters who really had some fascinating experiences with him. And I think if they ever make a kind of a biopic <laughs> on Fritz Peters and his experiences with Gurdjieff, it's going to be fantastic. But one of the things that happens is he catches Gurdjieff buying all of this really bad art from these seniors who are, you know, basically homeless in the park or whatever it happens to be. And Fritz Peter says, what are you doing this for? You know, this is some of the worst art in history. And he says, because it gives them dignity. So Gurdjieff has an incredible arc of generosity. It, there are outrageous stories of him, you know, dressing people down and, you know, uh, acting this way and that. And if you go back, you're going to find that I don't hear too many of those with Steiner, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he didn't seem to, the temperament was totally different, but Blavatsky, you have all kinds of stories of her, like, you know, pushing, throwing over tables and, you know, being foul mouthed and things like that. And, um, it's interesting because Blavatsky's partner in theosophy, Colonel Alcott, he, you know, he went to the masters at one point because he had all these contacts with the masters. And he said, why is Blavatsky like this? And they said, literally, 
Her temperament was such that it was keeping her alive. It was something about the kind of hot tempered nature that was, you know, was normal for her. <laughs> you know, I've so, been thinking a lot about that and really? how defiance yes. is an energy, a quality that we all need to have right now. And yes. um, I guess Jordan Peterson would call it uh, disagreeability, right? <laughs> or that, and yeah, isn't it he's, he's good. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's very good at that too. That's an excellent point, which is, um, well, you remind me of that thing that Steiner said, which is sometimes the most spiritual word in the world is no. Mm -hmm. Think about that. So when it comes to, you know, the kind of overreach that we're in the middle of, no is a very good word to listen to. Everyone you're watching, Gurdjieff saves the 21st century, Enneagram, food for the moon, the fourth way. It's all in this episode. But I think in the setup here, we've gotten some idea of the characters uh, that we're dealing with. We're going to take your questions in uh, the second part of tonight's program. It's about 45 minutes, and um, we'll go a couple more hours with you tonight. And Miss Olivia is putting those together right now. Miss Olivia, what do you got? I have something I really want to address. Caritas Taro says, caution about Gurdjieff. Perhaps he brought up some good things, but he was very cruel and cynical, not a nice guy at all. And he thought mankind was, quote, mostly human fertilizer, meaning worthless. Can you address Gurdjieff's dark side and his, uh, in particular, his attitude towards humans? Well, I kind of just was doing that. But no, I don't. Uh, the caution... The work is so um, solid in terms of how beneficial it is that, you know, you have people like Bennett and Spensky and others who, you know, went through all this trouble to bring the work forward. And I think what you, what you get at the end of the day is, you know, you have flawed people leading this stuff. But can you imagine how extraordinary Gurdjieff was? For someone like Ospensky, for example, to be like, I'm going to put everything in my entire life aside and follow this guy. And it's funny because when um, Bennett meets up with him later, because uh, it's interesting, and I'll, I'll kind of answer your question the roundabout way. Bennett, uh, J.G. Bennett, who becomes basically uh, kind of the biggest proponent of the ospensky Gurdjieff work in combination, um, and he was a British author, mathematician, and they tried to do a lot of things like for him. They wanted him to run for office, and he had all these connections with oil companies and stuff. He kept turning all that stuff down and going back to this work, and he became one of the most important voices for transformation uh, for the 21st century. And what he basically, uh, when he came to Ospensky, uh, you know, he had already, he'd had a little experience of Gurdjieff because he was sent to spy on him because the British were very interested in this Turkish prince and Gurdjieff was close to this prince. And so here we have Bennett listening in and, you know, kind of spying on Gurdjieff and then becoming fascinated by Gurdjieff being like, oh, I'm spying on this guy, but I, I'm learning a lot. And then he's like, you know what? I want to go and I want to go to the Gurdjieff Institute and learn. And Gurdjieff said, you can be the best of the best. But the problem was Bennett was already attached to Ospensky, and Ospensky at that point said, no one who's working with me can work with Gurdjieff. So he had to make a choice. And what's interesting is he chose Ospensky, and he, he would work with Ospensky for 25 years. And then he would come back when Ospensky died and work with Gurdjieff for two. And he said that the two years that he worked with Gurdjieff for were worth all the 25 that he worked with Ospensky for. So, you know, we have to understand just how extraordinary uh, Gurdjieff was in that sense. So, you know, in, in terms of bringing forward the teaching. And if you look at the material, like I said, it's still on a level that I don't think it's understood um, exactly where it is. But, you know, any work, you, you always need, you know, there never should be this kind of cult-like uh, idolatry <laughs> when it comes to this work. But I think um, certainly when you get it around the, the Gurdjieff work, the point is that I think through the decades of bringing it forward, something remarkable came out of it. And, uh, you know, you do, you suffer some casualties along the way, as it were, just like Ospensky said, I'm not dealing with this anymore, you know, and all the people that go to work with him to become Gurdjieff's number one you know, man, he can never transfer the teaching to them because there's some kind of flaw in him. But again, 
You know, we're looking at the flaws and the incredible genius involved here. And that's the way it goes when you're human, I guess. <laughs> um, what else you got? I love this. Val says, Gurdjieff said that he had failed and that the only thing that could save humanity was to find a way to prevent people from kowtowing to authority. Yeah, um, there's always, look, whether it's Steiner or Gurdjieff or any of these guys, there's some feeling at a certain point of failure. Um, but it's only because they've set themselves literally to the task of freeing the world. <laughs> I kid you not. And they feel that they put this tremendous burden on themselves. So Spensky does the same thing. And uh, it's a fantastic quality that they have, that they realize that there's a tradition and a teaching that can be brought forward that would turn humanity in a completely different direction. And so there's a kind of uh, internal guilt, you know, when they're dying and they're looking over and they're saying, you know, you all are still stuck in a mess and I didn't make things better. Well, in fact, they do make things incredibly better on an, on a level. And you'll see just how much of that work in the 21st century pays off if people are listening and it ignites basically, you know, a complete second wave of the mysteries on a totally different level. If, you know, enough people kind of come around to it. Um, couple of things on Bennett. Um, oh, and that was what I was going to point out, which is when Ospensky said to Bennett, you know, you can't uh, work with him and work with me. And he said, well, why, you know, if Gurdjieff was so bad, you know, if you, to the point where you can't even deal with him, like, why did you work with him for so long? And Ospensky said to him, you can't understand how incredible Gurdjieff was. Like, you have no idea. He was basically all the mysteries that I'd been seeking my whole life. He was there. He was embodied it. And so he was kind of the living uh, ascended master. And so it was quite, you know, this is quite a challenge for a number of these guys, which is what happens when the thing that you've been searching for shows up, but there are flaws. <laughs> uh, and that's a question I think that we all have to answer, really. Here's a quote from Bennett before he passed away in 1975, quote, the very aim of our society seems to be to remove from people responsibility for their lives and acts. The way of transformation must be the exact opposite of this. Whatever else it may lead to, it must make us into free, responsible individuals able to direct our own lives in accordance with the greatest objective good. So there's a lot in there, but you can see this kind of powerful statement of transformation. Now, he's not saying fourth way school. He's not saying mystery. He's saying the way is transformation. And this was what he was working on when he died. Everything was about transformation. And the whole movement that he had captured uh, of working with Gurdjieff for three years and working with Ospensky for 25 and all the people that he worked with, um, like Pak Suba, who brought forward uh -huh. Subud and, um, you know, Shiva Puri, Baba, you know, incredible, this guru lived to 135 years old, all these incredible things. So he worked with all, he worked with the Sufi tradition um, and his, what he came to uh, at the end of his life was, this is the work, the name of the work is transformation. So, that's where we kind of come in now into the story was thinking with that in the back of our heads, he puts the statement, you know, 40 some odd years ago, transformation. Let's keep that in mind as we go forward. The whole work is really about transformation. By the way, that's a shot. I found the only shot of Bennett with Gurdjieff and it's shortly before Gurdjieff dies, but we get a shot there of them sitting together and that, um, is Bennett sitting with a very aged Gurdjieff. And it's fascinating because when Gurdjieff gets older and when he has these difficulties, the people who have worked with him are so used to him being vital even to, into his older, you know, senior years that it's very hard for them to accept in the last couple of months of his life as the vitality level has gone down. There are odd stories about Gurdjieff's death. In fact, um, I read, uh, I have a quote that I'm going to read about this tonight. There's a whole letter there 
but um, I've condensed it down. But there's a lot of strange things that, you know, uh, Gurdjieff does even when he's in the hospital. You know, at a certain point he shows up, <laughs> you know, uh, and Bennett thinks, oh, I've just visited him on his deathbed. And then he sees him at a fruit stand, you know, <laughs> completely dressed up in a suit and like looking much younger. So there's something very unusual about Gurdjieff. And these people are not, you know, making it up or fantasizing. They see him shape-shifting a lot. <laughs> That's in the original books, too. In Search of the Miraculous has a whole shape-shifting thing with Ospensky putting it on the record. And what's funny is if you go into that account, there are three different accounts by three different students, one of which is Ospensky, who all say the same thing. We were looking at him, seeing him off on this train platform, and when he goes and he turns, he becomes... He changes into a totally different person. So I've kept those accounts tonight because I think the ability to uh, shape shift and present yourself completely differently comes directly out of the schools. And they have rules against ab uh, abusing that <laughs> as well. But when we hear about this uh, aspect, it's a fact. It, it's definitely a fact that they can do this. What do you hey, got? I, I want to throw you a question here because it's often understood that the Espensky Gurdjieff split was somehow a mistake. An error was made, but was I think, it, yeah. was it necessary? I mean, if Gurdjieff said you shouldn't count out to authority, then Espensky, did he provoke people to break off at a certain point to start their own movements and to defy him? Well, it's very interesting. And I think that that gets us into interesting territory because he could very well have been, you know, spurning them so they didn't become dependent. Uh, it seems to me that Gurdjieff's statement, you know, um, he said one of the things about the Gurdjieff work is that we have a series of different eyes, individualities inside of us, and that that's the problem in that something on the outside, you know, is kind of wheel of eyes is turning and these things happen that move us into a different uh, identity. And that until we become a singular I, we can't really express what we are and do our best. But what's fascinating is, uh, you know, one of the other things that Ospensky said about Gurdjieff was that he had advanced himself to such a level that he had one very good eye left and one bad one. <laughs> and that's what we get in the Gurdjieff story. He'd advanced, uh, you know, almost to a saintly way with the things he was doing. You know, if you look into him and we're going to get into this tonight, he spent a lot of his time healing people. And you don't hear a lot about that with Gurdjieff, but it's one of the little skills he had back there. Um, and there's a lot of charity in the, in the Gurdjieff work. So he's very generous with what he's doing. At the same time, you know, there's a trail of unhappy um, people who, you know, he he had alienated. So we get that kind of back and forth. More Bennett on this. And I think what we're going to do is go back through Bennett into Gurdjieff here. But this is Bennett in 71 talking about what we're going to come into over the next 50 years and the period we're in. We have a time in front of us that we have to live through, and it is the next 50 years that will be critical. It is wise to look at the 50 years that are coming as a whole, whether it is for ourselves or for those who will have to face the world of 2020, or those who know that their children will have to face that world. There are some things that we can predict about it with confidence, and the most important of that is going to be the very different from the world that we are living in today. The environment of our life on the earth is changing very rapidly at an accelerated pace, and it's not possible to conceive that any events other than major catastrophes will prevent accelerated change. So either we will have a catastrophic change, which will leave the world having to pick up the bits and start again, nuclear incident, earth changes, whatever that would happen to be, or we shall have an explosive change that will leave us with a world that will be very difficult to live in. And it will be a world that will be progressively more difficult to live in because of the greater congestion, because of the more intensive interaction between people, the various consequences of the way we've lived on this earth, especially in the first half of the 20th century, which have left us a very difficult legacy 
for those who have to live for the next 50 years. They can see it there. Um, and it's interesting because I think with Bennett in particular, um, he was able to look out at what was coming. And, you know, he wasn't on the master level of Gurdjieff. Neither was he, you know, um, the kind of obsessive Ospensky type personality. He's definitely like an incredibly intelligent, but very down to earth person. And he's the one I think bringing that information forward that can see out into the future. And he's also, you know, uh, somebody who's a geologist and has all these other skills, somebody who just has a practical uh, application on the science. So there we have them looking out and saying, what kind of a tool can we leave for these people facing this into the 2020s? And it gets interesting how they do this. <laughs> I'm going to show you how everyone you're watching the Dark Journalist show, Gurdjieff saves the 21st century. Enneagram, food for the moon, the fourth way. It's all going to be revealed tonight. And um, we're going to take your questions, as I mentioned. Miss Olivia, you're up. Dow Jones Muller said, didn't Gurdjieff dislike idleness? He said, always be working. Yeah, well, that's really true. Actually, that's what's interesting, I think, about the Gurdjieff work versus any of the others, because um, the emphasis, you know, a lot of people came to him who were the kind of elite intellectuals of the day, and he would disappoint them by saying, you know, let's go dig a ditch together. <laughs> and he, there's so much that's in the Gurdjieff work, which is about um, physically dealing with your moving center and that the, the mind basically comes to better conclusions. But a lot of, this turned a lot of people off. And I remember because I've uh, interacted with groups who were Ospensky groups, Bennett groups, and Gurdjieff groups. And I remember there was one group <laughs> and they were very nice people too, but their whole idea about me working with them was, uh, operating some kind of buzzsaw or something. <laughs> and they wanted to like cut logs in the forest and things like this. This is part of the setup of the thing, but it was so ultimately impractical for what I was looking for. But you can see that inclination, getting back to earth, being able to know the things and to be able to silence your mind enough to use your body. Um, it's there. There's, there's a thread there in the work. Um, I want to say this when I mentioned that Bennett um, just to kind of close out the Bennett section a little bit. Bennett, when he was spying on Gurdjieff, was a young intelligence officer for the British military. And uh, he also was staggering six foot six. And uh, the period where he met Gurdjieff is there. That's when he's 21. So he sees a long arc of life um, for Bennett. And that's him, of course, the tall one here. Very interesting indeed that at the end of his life, what is he doing? He's teaching the Gurdjieff movements to his students and he's creating the conditions again that he went through with Gurdjieff. So we can see the whole generation there um, of that work, the genealogy of it went directly into Biden, uh, into Biden, <laughs> into Bennett. And what was for me, I think important when I'm looking at Bennett's work is that you you have somebody who not only, you know, like if you look at Gurdjieff and Ospensky, they go through the Russian Revolution, they go through the wars, and um, Bennett was an officer. You know, he also went through these things, but he has the ability to see the world past where it leads to right after World War II. They never got that ability because they were at the end of their lives. So I think there's something very important uh, about the kind of noble action of bringing the work forward after the fact. Um, some of the people who got uh, very involved with the Gurdjieff work, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, and the whole Taliesin thing comes directly out of the fourth way uh, school. And, you know, they worked very closely with Bennett there. Um, one other thing I want to say in relation to when we look at students of the work is that I think that a lot of this work is defined by how well you did with the students. And um, 
part of the problem, I think, with Gurdjieff being the character that he was, it was very difficult for him to pass that level of knowledge and intensity onto somebody else. And, um, you know, by losing certain people uh, like Ospensky, he, he was not able to transfer it. And what he describes himself about how the mystery schools work is that the the way that it operates on that level is the ma the master himself to move up a level needs to transfer to the student the ability to rise above and come up. Uh, and so he transfers the teaching. That's how he rises or she rises. So um, when we get into thinking about that, we can say this with Gurdjieff that he did amazing things. He spread a lot of knowledge, but he didn't seem able to transfer that knowledge to someone else. And so the traditions themselves, I've noticed this as well uh, with Steiner's work, but what happens is they, they influence so many people and they cause such a change in that society that that's, that becomes their legacy. Um, but it does seem like, you know, a lot of them, as soon as the person is gone, much of the dy dynamism of the movement leaves. So you have these incredible people, you know, people who were in the same room with Steiner said in one conversation, he'd change your life. Uh, and with Gurdjieff, again, you know, there are people who just from being around him, just like he was unforgettable. So um, that dynamic personality, it is, you know, a gift and it is, you know, in time and space, it's a fleeting gift. So we're very lucky when we get them. Um, a little more on... Uh, some of these quotes relating to what we're talking about here. And I'm going to go back to Beelzebub. Everyone, you're watching The Dark Journalist Show. Coming up here on 10 o'clock tonight, this very special episode. We're already an hour in, and we're going to take your questions about a half hour here. So I'm going to try to really uh, jam in some of this very important information. And it's great to have so many of you here with us. I want to remind you before we go any further to go to darkjournalist.com and sign up for our newsletter. That's a free newsletter, especially if you're new. You cannot rely on the social media networks to give you a heads up on the shows that we're doing and the incredible events uh, that we have coming up for you, documentaries, live events, everything else. Go to the free newsletter at darkjournalist.com. Sign up. It takes 20 seconds. And basically, we'll let you know the incredible X series episodes that we have coming up for you. And that's a way to stand up and be counted uh, to make sure we have that. We're following through incredible, and I mean incredible censorship. They're just now having people in Canada who are doing podcasts submit to the government. Well, here's the podcast we're doing. Here's oh. the guests. Here's the material. Do we pass? <laughs> Uh, you know, and Canada, I mean, I can't believe those people would even go for it. So, um, for all our Canadian, I think they don't know what choice they have. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, this is going to be another one of these huge battles and to our Canadian friends, you know, a lot of strength to you. And it's <laughs> the attempts by, you know, the Trudeau regime to impose that kind of world economic forum, uh, absolutely ridiculous. So, you know, completely resist that, and I wouldn't go along with it at all. Um, if it comes here, forget it. You're going <laughs> to have wide open anarchy because that's just the, the nature of the thing. Okay, um, what does Gurdjieff tell us about Beelzebub's tale? Did I say enough about the newsletter? Yes. <laughs> so sign up for the newsletter already. Okay. Um, and uh, one other thing I want to mention also, which is that um, the shows, so you know what you have coming up here, this is Mystery October. So the mystery schools, the deep traditions, uh, you're going to find things in very, very laid out in very, very special ways about the kind of mystical, uh, esoteric aspects of things this month. This is the month for it. I know there's a lot of political things going on, so we're going to shoot in those um, very important special reports along the way. Okay. Beelzebub's Tales. Beelzebub's Tales, uh, I, I mentioned it in the beginning, and let's just say this about it, which is it contains this story about um, Beelzebub and how he gets trapped here. He gets trapped on Mars. <laughs> and he's from the planet Caratus, but he always explores this system 
going back and forth. And uh, there's a group of his, which is kind of exiled on Mars. And so what happens is um, part of that group ventures here to the earth. And there's a number of incidents of Beelzebub talking about that. And the tales are to his grandson. So he's, you know, he's on the spaceship driving around and talking about his various visits to the earth and what the people are like and all the rest of it. So that is the nature of the kind of mythology, the story, the science fiction of the book. Uh, reading about when it was started in 1926 was a 24-year process to that becoming completed. So think of how much is really in that book um, and all the different hands that it went through. Some of the greatest literary minds were attracted to Gurdjieff, as I mentioned. So they all had a hand in kind of bringing this forward. Uh, but this was a whole piece that was separate from uh, Ospensky and the things he was doing. So during a QA and a uh, with Gurdjieff, the question comes up, sir, I asked you if there was any way to develop attention. You said that attention was measured in the degree that one remembers oneself. You told me especially, look into myself. I asked you that because I wasn't able to put my attention on the reading of Beelzebub's tales. During this week, I understood the attention was that was what I was. As many eyes, as many were, so many different attentions. I wanted to ask you if there was, for developing attention, a method of I am or if there are other special methods. <laughs> this is a question he got a lot. They were always asking him, what's the exercise? What's going to make me develop my attention, my focus? Gurdjieff says, one thing I can tell you, methods do not exist. I do not know any. But I can explain now everything simply. For example, in Beelzebub, I know there is everything one must know. It is a very interesting book. Everything is there, all that exists, all that has existed, all that can exist. The beginning, the end, all the secrets of the creation of the world, all is there. But one must understand, and to understand depends on one's individuality for it is an objective book. The more man has been instructed in a certain way, the more he can see. One person understands one part, another a thousand times more. Now find a way to put your attention on understanding all of Beelzebub. This will be your task, and it is a good way to fix real attention. If you can put real attention on Beelzebub, you can have a real attention in your life. You didn't know this secret. In Beelzebub, there is everything. There he says it again. Now, this is twice. I have said it, even how to make an omelet, among other things. As explained at the same time, there isn't a word in Beelzebub about cooking. Don't get me wrong. Put your attention on Beelzebub, another attention than that to which you are accustomed, and you'll be able to have the same attention in your life. So he's suggesting, really, that we have something very power-packed in the book. This is Gurdjieff responding. And the response is somewhat flippant, because, of course, he's done nothing but teach methods and all the rest of it. But this person is obviously desperate for a method, and what they need to learn is, well, you know what? You've got the book. Work with the book. Um, and it's very interesting to me, because what you have very often, too, is he's referring people back to their own powers. So very often, I think the guru situation that we come up against later with this huge influx of gurus, which is something that people who they try to make into gurus, like Krishnamurti, et cetera, turned down. They thought this idea was terrible. You know, uh, so sort of like the, the biggest example, I guess, is the Beatles and the Maharishi. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and you know what? They, they probably learned some things from the Maharishi, don't get me wrong. But I think it's pretty interesting that we get into this whole piece about turning over authority. And there's a gigantic wave of all these people going to Eastern authorities and you know handing over their money and, and everything else. And it goes on through the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, and then there's kind of a breakdown. You know, but you still see it happening in different ways. But this real kind of Eastern guru, Eastern master thing um, became 
basically, you know, one of the things that Krishnamurti talks about is he meets with one of these, you know, kind of major yogi masters, <laughs> gurus, who's over here in the United States. And um, Krishnamurti has gone on and done his own teaching. He's sworn off theosophy and everything. And he lives in Ojai in California. And this guy is, is giving a, uh, you know, kind of a, one of his big major conferences. And he really wants to meet Krishnamurti. So Krishnamurti meets him afterwards and he's sitting down there expecting to have this very spiritual conversation with this guy. And the guy pulls out a map of where he has students and all the different amounts of students in different countries that he has and how much money he makes from each country. <laughs> uh, so there's, you know, he's, he's basically giving him, this is my business plan. What do you think? Uh, so, you know, people have turned spirituality into a business. It, it happened and we've gone through, we've seen the excesses of it. And I think that got people uh, very cynical around it. In fact, I don't uh, kind of uh, encourage any kind of cynicism around spiritual endeavor. I just think, you know, you have to have a good filter. As we've seen, you know, uh, there are entities out there, the kind of Gaia TV style entities that try to draw people in and aren't working so much with the idea of, hey, you know, you can really advance yourself. You can get some things going. They're working more with the idea of a marketing plan. So you're surrounded by that whenever you deal with this stuff. Whenever you're dealing around spirituality issues or things that go deep, like the UFO file and things of this nature, you're surrounded by the intelligence corridor on one hand, which loves to data mind and manipulate um, the space and then the actual marketeers on the other. And right down the middle, you're going to find real quality once in a while. There's some real great stuff if you can get to it. So that's kind of the, uh, the way I would look at it. But I think it is important to see in a sense that part of this, you know, people coming in and asking the questions, the Gurdjieff answers are basically telling them, hey, you know, it's there, like you kind of, it's up to you to get it. Um, all right. Now, Ospensky's interpretation of what Gurdjieff was doing and how he applied it and how, you know, remarkable he thought Gurdjieff was. This is very important because Ospensky's quite a remarkable thinker. And I think that his work um, side by side with Gurdjieff's is, is just as important just as vital. Um, here's what Ospensky has to say about psychology in general and its various manifestations and culture, which I think is interesting. He says, after the disappearance of the mysteries, psychology existed in the form of symbolical teachings, which were sometimes connected with the religion of the period and sometimes not connected such as astrology, alchemy, magic, and more modern masonry, occultism, and theosophy. And here it's necessary to note that all psychological systems and doctrines, those that exist or existed openly, and those that were hidden or disguised, can be divided into two chief categories. First, systems which study man as they find him, or such as they suppose or imagine him to be. Modern scientific psychology, or what is known under the name, belongs to this category. So what we have in psychology is, you know, they're dealing with people as they find them. Second, systems which study humanity, not from the point of view of what he is or what he seems to be, but from the point of view of what he may become, that is from the point of view of possible evolution. These last systems are in reality the original ones, or in any case, the oldest, and only they can explain the forgotten origin and the moaning of psychology. Uh, I think that's supposed to be meaning. It's a typo. <laughs> uh, but moaning of psychology, you can see that. So the point that he's getting to here is very interesting, which is psychology is kind of hijacked at a certain point when we get you know, into the 20th century. But it serves this role throughout the mysteries. And in fact, the mysteries operate through different psychological systems over time. And the key that he's suggesting is well, you know, you can, in a very Freudian kind of way, in a day-to-day -day 
type way. You can get into somebody's unconscious and deal with them from the level where they're at now. Or you can say, well, you know, they have potential here, even spiritual potential, and to break into this whole other thing. And so there's a system of psychology which exists above what we understand as psychology. I think this is important to recapture what that is, in fact, um, because the only thing that we get a glimmer of it is in Jung's work, we get a glimmer of going beyond what we understand as traditional psychology. And it has, I mean, it's had this incredible impact over time, but I think what Ospensky is getting at is, no, no, this is, this is actually, you know, misapplication of the term. And so when you get into um, the Gurdjieff work, what Ospensky is suggesting is the psychology of humanity's possible evolution. That's the way to look at it. And so a number of these techniques, in fact, are mental. <laughs> After all, uh, you know, so we have this whole mind-body piece with the physical movements, but really these are conceptual pieces. Now, what I tried to do, I did a little experiment today, and without writing them down, I said to myself, what have I learned from the Gurdjieff work over the years? And I am going to read it here. Uh, as opposed to trusting my memory on the spot. But these are very interesting points, and I'll, I'm going to bring them all forward here in a very short uh, wave. Magnetic center, accumulators, self-remembering, Kundebuffer, chief feature, man number one through seven, the wheel of eyes, the Enneagram, intentional suffering, conscious pain, the stop exercise, the fourth way, the first way of the priest, the second way of the fakir, the third way of the yogi, and the fourth way of this unusual mystery teaching, which can only happen in everyday life, by the way. All the other ways of developing and uh, evolving have to go through, basically, you know, either a monastery or seclusion or, you know, um, to develop them. And so they are incredible things to do. But the fourth way that Gurdjieff brought forward can only work in the conditions of life that you're in. That's the only place that it can be developed. It can't be developed on a mountaintop. That's what makes it very unusual and very timely, I think, for the period that we're in. Um, Beelzebub's Tales, super efforts, being in essence, what to do versus how to do it, sleep, mechanical laws, law of accident, Objective art, moving diagrams, harmonious development of humanity. These are, this is just a cross section that, you know, popped into my head basically of the things I've learned from the system over the years. It's so rich and there's so much in it that when we think of where it comes from in the mystery tradition, it comes out of that Gurdjieff went in to study and then came out. Remember, a lot of people um, in mystery schools, they, go into a mystery center. But then what we find is, um, and Gurdjieff pointed this out often, they're in everyday roles in daily life. They're, you know, police chiefs, um, they're doctors, you know, they're librarians, whatever it happens to be. So they, they have that role that can go back and forth on that mystery side. And I think that that's a very crucial thing for us to remember because there are times when people encounter people in these positions and they really think, well, something very unusual happened. And there's probably a reason for that. I think interspersed with our society are advanced individuals. They're not aliens. <laughs> you know, we don't even have to uh, touch on that. It is, it's an advanced level. It's somebody who's advanced themselves and works with the mysteries. And um, we find them kind of intermingled throughout the entire society. Remember when we get to Steiner talking about the political scene in 1920. So basically the entire political system in America is schools of the right-hand path and mystery schools of the left-hand path. And the left-hand path had a big advantage in the political scene at the time. So um, you're dealing, you're in this kind of soup of the mysteries on a, a regular basis. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist X series episode 150.
59. This is Gurdjieff Saves the 21st Century. Enneagram, Food for the Moon. Oh, the Food for the Moon's coming up. Uh, and the fourth way revealed. We're going to be taking your questions here pretty shortly. Uh, I would say in 15 minutes or so. And before I go any further, mm -hmm. Ms. Olivia, you're Kyle up. Kyle the White says, what does DJ say about the self-remembering exercise? Whitley Strieber did this exercise before his communion ET experience. No question. And, uh, you know, Strieber was in a Gurdjieff school in New York and uh, he, he wrote The Hunger. I don't know if a lot of people know that. Fast, it's incredible vampire book. They turned into a movie. Bowie was one of the vampires. <laughs> Catherine Deneuve, um, and Straper was, you know, kind of already on a very interesting track before communion. So when you get to the kind of alien uh, crossover piece, the contact E piece with him, it's just another chapter in the kind of unusual things that took place with him. One of the things I've always given Straber credit for is having the courage to go on the record with how strange the experiences were, <laughs> whether, you know, however you interpret them. And, you know, this is somebody with a writer's imagination. Sure. You could say that. Um, so we don't know, but there are, there are some very interesting things I would say in his writings about it. And it seems to me swimming in the mysteries of the fourth way had a big piece of that, but I'm glad you brought that up. I will tell you, uh, you know, there's a number of people in society. It's interesting that Bill Murray played the main character in Groundhog Day, because that's somebody who's very, very deep in working with the fourth way uh, stuff, at least at, at the time. And he had been, I'd heard that he'd been involved with it since the 1980s. Can I ask you about that? Because it's kind of interesting. We don't associate humor with the fourth way at all. <laughs> In fact, I remember you meeting someone who was part of a school and he had no affect whatsoever. It was really disturbing because he wouldn't smile. He wouldn't emote at all because uh, yeah, he was oh, so he thought, busy self-remembering. Yeah, yeah, he thought that he had to, in order to be aware, you just need, couldn't laugh about anything. This is very interesting because. Um, Bennett gives us a real view of how the system developed after Gurdjieff and Ospensky died. But what he said about Ospensky was Ospensky felt like the whole nature. I have a quote about this. Actually, I read the quote, but uh, Ospensky felt that the whole nature of reality was about having to escape <laughs> from life through this kind of, you know, esoteric realization. And that, so he was constantly about, you know, life is limiting and we need to escape it. But he said that Gurdjieff lived, you know, and it was, it was the very embodiment of humor, you know, through dinner parties, did the toast of the idiots where everybody got drunk and stuff. I mean, he, you know, and he also, what amazed Bennett when he went to visit Gurdjieff, after working with Ospensky for a while, he was like, you know, he had these gigantic pictures of Jesus in the living room. Like he had all this religious iconography everywhere. And, uh, you know, so Ospensky, a lot of the Ospensky, because it's so intellectual and it's so knowledgeable, it's kind of a great way to present the system, but it is, it, it's a joyless, there are joyless aspects to it. And I think the, the Gurdjieff thing based on what people remember. And you can also listen to the different music that Gurdjieff developed. Um, there's an incredible series of recordings they released that I have actually, which is Gurdjieff playing the harmonium of all the temple songs that he went to these different mystery schools, developing, understanding what music was about and the language that was going on. And those you know, recordings of him playing the harmonium are very, very strange right at the end of his life. So, um, no, he had a great sense of passion in his life, but I, I think that what we have is an inherited thing mm -hmm. through the, the kind of intellectualism of Ospensky. At the same time, Ospensky's an incredible thinker. You know, he's a dynamic thinker and he is much better at explaining Gurdjieff's system in any way, shape or form in books than Gurdjieff ever was. If you put, search of the miraculous next to Beelzebub. I mean, you know, uh, you can get through in search of the miraculous as complex as it is 
and understand Gurdjieff's system. Even Gurdjieff said that. Beelzebub is, you know, you're really going into an interesting place. There's a quote about Beelzebub in here that is in A.R. Araj's book. Araj is interesting, and uh, I point him out as a very overlooked character in America, uh, who was a Brit um, in America in New York who set up Gurdjieff in America and died. And when he died, all of the Gurdjieff work in America went off the cliff. That was a very major problem. But he was the one who coined the term New Age, and he had the New Age Journal. He was absolute uh, genius. And there's a great book uh, about him and Gurdjieff called Gurdjieff and Araj, Brothers in Elysium, um, Paul Beckham Taylor. But this is interesting. Here's Gurdjieff's quote that he opens the book with. I am Beelzebub traveling the solar system, telling my grandson the history of the countries as we pass. We begin with Atlantis and end with a picture of the America of the future. The future of America is in the Beelzebub book. This is the interesting and uh, kind of fascinating thing. And if, as I've gone into it, I've found the prophecy in it. Just as I found the prophecy <laughs> And the Steiner work and Steiner's prophecy of Araman in the 21st century, you know, it's interesting. We don't hear about their prophecies in a sense. I think we're more likely to hear about, you know, Nostradamus or the sleeping prophet. You know, what they do with Casey very often is they're like, he prophesized all these disasters and half of them, you know, he didn't. He talked about the different ways that humanity could go. Um, so it's kind of a way in, you know, but the prophecies that come out of Gurdjieff's work are, are quite interesting. And it's the same with Steiner. They see a challenge when you get into this period. If you look at theosophy, they're like, oh, we move into a new root race. Everyone's psychic. <laughs> you know, we live in a, under a more spiritual domain. You know, everything looks lovely in the future. It's not so with the Steiner work. The Steiner work is there's such a clash between um, the eighth sphere and Araman and humanity, that if, if humanity is not awake to it, then that clash could throw off the entire developmental wave in evolution, spiritual evolution of humanity, and put us in a totally different development track, you know? Um, and it's not pretty, you know? <laughs> so when you get into the Gurdjieff work, they're warning. You know, Bennett's warning. Those things that I read earlier, Gurdjieff is warning. Ospensky is warning. And these are kind of almost, um, you know, they're not fear-mongering. They're saying, this is where things are going. You have to wake up. The culture has to wake up. And here are the tools that we've lost. Here is access back to those tools. Maybe we can find the way back. That, I think, is a very kind of crucial way to look at it. Um, so I'm going to take a couple of these terms that, uh, oh, you know, I said I was going to read the quote about Bennett. Then I'll go over the terms, and then we'll go to your questions. How's mm -hmm. that? Sounds good. Does that sound like a plan? Everyone here watching the Dark Journalist show, this is X Series 159, Gurdjieff Saves the 21st Century, Enneagram, Food for the Moon, The Fourth Way Revealed. We're going to get to all of them. Um, here is that thing you were talking about versus the, the humor <laughs> and Bennett sizing up Gurdjieff versus Ospensky. Um, now this is Bennett talking, remember he, two decades of being a student. Ospensky's concept of human destiny was clearly bound up with the idea of escape. In later years, this need to escape from recurrence became almost an obsession which he transmitted to his closest followers, such as Rodney Collins Smith. Now, I want to say something weird about Rodney Collins Smith, who was very interesting in his own right as the chief pupil of Ospensky. When Ospensky dies, he tries to um, take the whole work to Mexico, Smith. And he starts a whole fourth way thing there based on Ospensky's work. And then he falls out a window. Um, there's, there's a, yeah, I know. Uh, now, I'll tell you what's interesting about this. If you really track closely on the fourth way piece, um, you're going to find that Gurdjieff was setting up a center in Taos, New Mexico, 
that was where the actual priory was going to be. It was like the American version of the priory chateau. And that's where the harmonious development of humanity, that's where they were going to be. And the senator who was helping him set it up, he uh, dies in one of the first plane explosions in domestic travel in 1927, I think the year was. And then they institute all these things as a result of that crash. But uh, I just found that, you know, there's a lot of things working in the background against these people. There's that amazing example of Edgar Casey, and he goes, you know, to um, find this lapis lazuli that the Atlanteans used in Arizona. And he's driving down to Arizona and he gets a flat tire. Well, okay, he gets a flat tire. And then he gets another flat tire. And then he gets another one, you know, and it, it's almost like this weird challenge uh, on an astral level stopping them creating problems. And when I was going through uh, Gurdjieff and Bennett's accounts of Gurdjieff over and over again, there's this thing they're going to, you know, these meetings, they're going to do these things to set up the next level of things and the car, you know, there's terrible problems with the car and they, they have to spend three days. And because of that, they miss their connection and the person sails back to America. You know, there's all kinds of that. And, um, it feels like some kind of, you know, I don't know, astral sabotage or something. Mm. But uh, be that as it as it is, there's still a point to be made, I think, on this. Okay. Ospensky's concept, so he transmitted it to Rodney Collins Smith. Avoidance of involvement in the world process was associated with the idea of escaping from recurrence. So in recurrence, in Ospensky's mind, it's like Groundhog Day. You... The end of your life is a circle that starts up your whole life again. So that's how recurrence works. Um, like many other Russians, he dreamed of a cultured spirituality which would create an environment in which an enlightened few could withdraw from the world and privately achieve liberation. This dream never entirely left him. Ospensky was, however, entirely unable to follow Gurdjieff through the final stages of his work. The outcome was that after giving Gurdjieff his full support up to the time of going to America in 1923, he entirely changed in 1924 while Gurdjieff was still in America. From that time until the end of his life, he had no direct communication with Gurdjieff. I think that's significant. He remained passionately interested in everything Gurdjieff was doing, however. After his break with Gurdjieff, Ospensky returned to his earlier writings. Um, and it's interesting... I think that gives us some idea, you know, uh, and Talks with the Devil is the book where Bennett does this incredible forward laying out how it was with these two. But I think we have to keep this in mind with Ospensky. Um, when you get into some of the groups that developed, I don't think, you know, it's hard. I could never recommend any particular group. And I worked with them. I do think that over and over again, you'd encounter people who were trying to do the work. And the, there's remarkable people <laughs> that are still in um, those groups, whether you're dealing with the Bennett people um, or the Gurdjieff Foundation people. There, there's so many interesting people there. But um, just like with the Steiner groups, there's a lot of people tackling the concepts. I think what's missing is... Uh, and it's just a kind of a fundamental thing. I think when it comes to a Spensky, you get the real intellectual trip and that's the one that was, has that escape thing in it. And that's the one that I think is also um, a little like it's missing. It is a humorless thing. Uh, oh, I forgot Joseph Stalin's in tonight's episode. <laughs> 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 Whew. Uh, how are we doing out there? Ideas from, whoa. Okay. <laughs> It's a great crowd uh, to be out there with us tonight. And Miss Olivia is running the show, keeping us going. Uh, I've told you already, if you're new, go for the newsletter. Uh, it's a free newsletter at darkjournalist.com. And it keeps us in touch through this remarkable censorship that we're looking at. We're going to be taking your questions here momentarily. I mentioned the shape shifting uh, thing, and I didn't want to mention it without giving you a good example. And this, again... A couple of things about Ospensky. By the way, uh, if you want to read something that has an eerie echo for today, it's a nice book called Spensky Letters from Russia. And this is about how the kind of 
bizarre things that were happening as a new regime of the Bolsheviks was coming in. Absolutely remarkable. Um, but we have to uh, really see, in a sense, how remarkable, and on his own, uh, Ospensky was. Let me say this about Ospensky. Before he met Gurdjieff or anything, he already was big on the lecture circuit with his own ideas. He was an award-winning journalist. He already had a best-selling book dealing with the esoteric. You know, he had all the connections that Gurdjieff didn't have, in fact. And so we have to remember that um, although he becomes the main pupil and spokesman for Gurdjieff before he splits from him after a few years, he he had a very defined career on his own. Uh, and some of the pictures I love, I think, that reveal the relationship between the two. This is a rare shot of Gurdjieff and Ospensky together, but uh, that's Ospensky in the cap here. And you can see the kind of dominant personality that Gurdjieff was sitting there. And that, I think, says a lot about the two of them, which is Ospensky, I don't think, could grow <laughs> around somebody that dynamic. Well, you uh, get a classic introvert and a classic extrovert, right? <laughs> exactly. It's an incredible picture. I'm glad it exists because, um, you know, the more we dig into this, you see Gurdjieff and you have all these different pictures of Gurdjieff, but there's no pictures of them together. That's the only one I've ever seen. Um, so here's the interesting event that took place. They're seeing Gurdjieff off, and this gets into the kind of mystery school shape-shifting that Gurdjieff had the ability to do, and it's displayed in the book In Search of the Miraculous. He does a number of things. For example, when Ospensky is, you know, uh, troubled after he has learned all these exercises and everything from Gurdjieff, it seems like Gurdjieff is almost making fun of him and uh, Ospensky is, is pretty freaked out and Gurdjieff starts to do things. He speaks through his chest. So that's the first thing. And Ospensky is like, you know what? I'm, I'm getting out of here actually. <laughs> and, and Gurdjieff commands him, you know, stop, you know, and, um, but he's talking to him through his chest and he's looking around, licking his mouth and there's nothing happening. The, so Gurdjieff's voice is coming through his body. Um, these abilities and the different powers that these people have when they get into a mystery level, um, you hear a lot of different things like this. You know, I, there's a classic incident of Madame Blavatsky creating bananas, you know, in her hotel room and Henry Alcott is there and Henry Alcott is, you know, I mean, he's an ex general <laughs> and, uh, he's, he's somebody who was on the kind of Warren commission version of the Lincoln assassination. It was a very kind of down to earth guy for him to say, well, bananas appeared out of thin air. These people definitely have this ability. Um, so, Ospensky is off and away, you know, taking a train back after this incredible back and forth with Gurdjieff. And what happens is Gurdjieff shows up in his train <laughs> compartment. He pops in basically astrally. And he starts to say like, you know, hey, you took this too seriously. Don't let this throw you off in the work. And they have a whole conversation. And he's like, wait a minute. How did this guy pop in out of thin air, you know? So Ospensky deals with the miraculous when he's dealing with his, with Gurdjieff, including the fact that Gurdjieff can, you know, pop in at any time. Okay. Well, that's a little bit interesting, I would say. All right. So here's the shape-shifting incident. It's at Nikolevsky station, 1917. This is Ospensky's own words. Very interesting event took place in connection with his departure, Gurdjieff's. This happened at the railway station. We were all seeing him off at Nikolevsky station. Gurdjieff was standing, talking to us on the platform by the carriage. He was the usual Gurdjieff we had always known. After the second bell went into the carriage, he went into the carriage. His compartment was next to the door. Then he came to the window. He was different, exclamation point. In the window, we saw another man, totally different. Not the one who had gone into the train. He had changed during those few seconds. It is very dis difficult to describe what the difference was, but on the platform, he'd been an ordinary man like anyone else. And from the carriage, a man of quite a different order was looking at us with quite an exceptional importance and dignity in every look 
in every movement. Um, as though he had suddenly become a ruling prince or a statesman of some unknown kingdom to which he was traveling, into which we were seeing him off. Some of our party could not at the time clearly realize what was happening, but they felt and experienced in an emotional way something that was outside of the ordinary run of phenomena. All this lasted only a few seconds. The third bell followed the second bell almost immediately, and the train moved out. I do not remember who was the first to speak of this transfiguration of Gurdjieff when we were left alone. And then it appeared that we had all seen it, in fact, though we had not all equally realized what it was while it was taking place, but all without exception had felt something out of the ordinary had happened. So um, it's interesting because there's a, a journalist on this train who talks to him and he's like, oh, you know, I, I met this kind of royalty guy who was into arms dealing <laughs> and all this stuff. And he assumes all these things about Gurdjieff and he said, oh, uh, you know, well, what would you do during the war? You know, isn't it going to disturb your business? You know, it's going to disrupt things. Are you going to get richer? And Gurdjieff said, don't worry, we always make a profit. And it's interesting because later Ospensky reads the article and he realizes that the journalist was talking to Gurdjieff, putting on one of these shape-shifting things. And he's... The quote is basically that the mystery schools always make a profit. That is, they take any stressful situation like the war or whatever it happens to be, and they're still going to go along and spread these seeds throughout the world. These are the types of things, I think, that give us a, a hint of what's going on here with Gurdjieff. I've got a lot more, including the Joseph Stalin story. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to weave it in to our story tonight so we can make it in a reasonable hour. And with that, Miss Olivia, I'm turning it over to you and your questions. Okay, Dave Taylor, I'm under the impression that G's clients were the wealthy, wealthy variety. They like being kicked around by fiends. And Jason K says also Mr. G manifested classic patriarchal guru traits, but I guess it's a little late for him to be me too In Gurdjieff's defense, seemingly his favorite students were the women of the rope group with whom he shared some kind of plant hallucinogen or narcotic. Women of the rope were all lesbians, so I guess that makes him an open-minded patriarchal SOB. <laughs> well, um, Gurdjieff was very against drug use, so uh, keep that in mind. He never thought of drug use as a good formula for higher consciousness or whatever. It's interesting, in New Model of the Universe... Ospensky uses laughing gas <laughs> to get into these different states. Oh my God. I didn't know that. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. It's really wild actually. Um, but Gurdjieff says actually that there are schools, I'm sure these were left-hand schools who would um, take in people who were addicts just to see how various drugs worked with them. So I think those secret societies do that. But in terms of um, actually you know, advancing yourself on a spiritual level. He didn't say that, you know, drugs were incompatible with it. He just said that they were not the avenue for self-evolution, probably because the um, experiences that you get are of a temporary enlightenment nature. Um, so, you know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of people, of course, who believe in that. When I spent time here with Graham Hancock, he was telling me about his incredible ayahuasca experience. So there's different ways to look at it. But if you're looking at it from Gurdjieff's point of view, uh, no. The rope period, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I might do a show on rope. Rope is uh, very, you know, these very interesting ladies who are all literary giants like Jane Heap and others. And he totally gave them different methods for working. And it's interesting because one of the things that Ospensky says, um, because Ospensky is coming from this kind of almost puritanical point of view, and he said, well, this is proof that Gurdjieff's gone mad. You know, he has this group, which is all, you know, these lesbians, this is the 1930s, <laughs> you know, let's, let's be real about this. In the 1930s, that was about as far off the map as you could get. And 
But Gurdjieff is, you know, saying, hey, here's here's the training for the rope. And the rope, it's interesting, the group is tied together. So they, you know, it's like a strand, a string that keeps them together. And uh, so there is, there's a lot there, I think, with what Gurdjieff was doing in the 30s. I, I think that um, after the Ospensky period and then after the Priory period, Gurdjieff has a great deal of difficulty. And that's why I think Beelzebub's tales and In Search of the Miraculous become, you know, at the end of his life, the incredible renewing of all this stuff he had done before. Because remember, by the time he meets Ospensky, he's already in his 40s. So, you know, this is somebody who's already done a lot by 1915, you know. So when you're getting into the 40s and stuff, he's he's been on the map for a long, long time. But he, what he wanted to accomplish was getting the teaching out, bringing it out to humanity in a full form during his lifetime. And he kept choosing these different avenues to do that. And you, the immense effort that was involved was extraordinary. Now, I will say this about Ospensky, which is, um, oh, before I do that, this is the Herald of the Coming Good. This is the first attempt by Gurdjieff after Spensky to put out his own book. And then he withdraws it <laughs> from the market because it's not quite right. And it's sort of a confused version of his work. But the subtitle is interesting. The first appeal to contemporary humanity. So this is his version of the mystery schools reaching out to contemporary humanity. That is the late 20s, et cetera. And I think that this whole approach of Gurdjieff's was going places until the Great Depression. With the Great Depression, you find um, that, you know, for example, the, the Casey Hospital, the Edgar Casey Foundation, the hospital that he built with the readings and all the things that he was doing collapses. You know, um, the, the group that was supporting him, the stockbrokers out of New York, they withdraw their support. Um, Gurdjieff, you know, his work falls by the wayside. All these people have to figure out how to survive during the Depression. So the great wave that's happening there hits a real brick wall. So they've gone through, you know, the Russian Revolution. They've gone through World War I. In the 20s, they're building it up. They're, they're coming through all that. And then, boom, the Great Depression hits. Nothing's going on. Nobody's getting funded for anything. There's no way to really move the ball. So the 30s become interesting, and that's where things like the rope come in. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist show. This is X series episode 159. Gurdjieff saves the 21st century. Enneagram, food for the moon. I've got food for the moon, quote, coming up here shortly. And all of this, again, I'm extrapolating out and relating directly to the period that we're in, which is what these techniques and uh, materials were designed for. And so, in a sense, uh, these kind of representatives of the mysteries for us accomplished that. You know, we have that legacy there. The question is, have we absorbed, you know, have we answered the questions and the things that were raised by Gurdjieff and Spensky and Steiner and Casey? How are we working with those? How is it, how has it gone? Well, it's made a big difference for a lot of people, for sure. But it seems like in order for this to go forward, in order for this mystery tradition to go forward, something happens here in the period that we're in. That's what we're honing in on as we go. We're taking your questions, and um, we'll go for another half hour or so here. Uh, Miss Olivia. Jason Kay, Gurdjieff was all about Georgian-style rounds of alcohol. Get everybody as drunk as possible, see who's left standing or sitting. Toasts are a big thing in Black Sea Georgian culture near where G came from. Toast to the idiots. Everybody was a different geometric idiot. <laughs> yeah, the idiot thing is interesting. First of all, anyone who's a spiritual seeker is an idiot in the fourth way tradition. So we're all idiots. Is that so that we keep our humility? I think so, okay. yeah. Also, you know, it's it's kind of a, it's a good, <laughs> it's a good way to, to keep things in mind because on certain level, you know, nobody's as smart as all of us. So individually we all are kind of just groping in the dark. Um, I would say this though. Uh, it's interesting about the toast of the idiots because 
that's something that happens later in Gurdjieff's life. And what I think of it is, you know, at one point he's working with the groups and he's getting the, the best people together to do this whole thing. Then he's working on, um, you know, the, the different movements and he's bringing the uh, temple dances and all this. And those are remarkable things. It's the first time in America anyone's ever seen things like that. 1924, he has them doing the Gurdjieff work uh, and the Gurdjieff movements in these theaters in New York. I mean, just incredible stories from that. Um, but then you get into these different periods. By the time you're talking about the 1940s, I think we're talking about what I call the art of living. And I see this with other teachers also. Um, Krishnamurti is another one they start, the teaching becomes how they're living their lives, period. So it's not about what are you going to produce? When's your next book? <laughs> um, uh, you know, I think that these things are always working in the background, but uh, I think that then it comes down to like the art of living. And, you know, we do take a very interesting jump. If you think about, you know, say Bennett and Gurdjieff and Casey and people like that, and then when you get around to the nineties and uh, the stretches into the period that we're in, you know, like Deepak Chopra, right? Uh, you get, it's a, it's a kind of a superficial layer on top of mystery. It's like an idea of mystery based on the, um, the larger tradition, but it's, it's it, baby food really. Yeah. It's got mm -hmm. nothing of the depth and the potency um, that the Steiner work had or that the Gurdjieff work had. And they were working, look, you know, Gurdjieff, when he's in Moscow, he's working with 40 people, you know. <laughs> uh, it, he's not working with, you know, million subscribers down line or whatever. It's, it's 40 people. Did so, he ever turn people away? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they always... What would um, it take to be... I mean, because I know he needed funding right? The oh, students yeah. would fund him. What would it take to turn somebody away? Uh, um, I think that it's, we have a much more clear idea of how a Spensky's thing work. He actually, you know, put them through their paces. Um, so we have a better idea of how that went. But I think with Gurdjieff, as you can see, like what he did with Spensky when he met him, making it difficult, you know, meeting him in a very noisy place. Um, you know, he threw obstacles out there that if somebody wasn't serious, they wouldn't show back up. So I think that that's maybe. Would he test them by abusing them when they first showed up or would, would maybe certain types who, who kind of came puffed up? Um, well, yeah, abuse is a tricky word there, but so there were people who came to him. He had all kinds of techniques for things. For example, somebody came to him and said, oh, I'm a Hatha yoga master and you know, and Gurdjieff was like, oh, I don't know anything about Hatha Yoga, you know, like I, I never even heard of that, you know. And so he would play these games uh, very often. This guy tracked him down, you know, who was quite wealthy, who was looking for him to teach him, you know, the, the secrets of the mysteries. And he said, I finally found you. And he's like, you confusing me with my brother. I actually make carpets, you know. <laughs> and so he would do, he'd play a lot of games with people. There's a, one of the funniest stories in the whole thing is this woman, this wealthy woman who went to him to uh, quit smoking. And this is something that he was apparently remarkable at because people always came to him to quit drinking, smoking, all these different things. They were brought to him for this purpose. Uh, it's not widely known that FDR was brought to Gurdjieff for healing at the Priory in France. So, um, you know, this is the reputation that he had, the, the kind of multitasker that he was. But anyway, so she comes to him and he gives her all of these techniques for losing the desire to smoke. And finally, through hypnosis or something, it sticks. And uh, so she sends him this check for $10,000 back then. So 1931. <laughs> and... He sends her this letter being, and she's like, you're my teacher for life and all this stuff. And then he's like, you have a very special package coming. And he takes her favorite brand of cigarettes and he spends the $10,000 sending her cartons of this, her favorite cigarette. And, uh, 
you know, so she writes later, oh, what an incredible beast he was to do this. How could he do this to me? You know, and it's making fun of me and, it, you know, it's tempting me. It's all these terrible things. Like I used to think he was this great guru and things. So he wants to, he, he has, he's engaged in this process of shaking people off. <laughs> and it's weird. If you go into, um, Bennett did a study of Gurdjieff trying to figure out what this was all about. <laughs> And he was, you know, he was like, you know, there's some method to this madness because he'd seen it himself. And uh, later when he studied the Naqshbandi Sufis, who he thought Gurdjieff got a great deal of information from, the Naqshbandi had a particular type of Sufi who went after uh, the way of blame. So they have to be kind of stigmatized for what they do. They're intentionally put out there. <laughs> so he surmised this. He never got confirmation or anything. That's just a theory that he had, but it's pretty interesting. Woo Woo says, G was well known as the greatest hypnotherapist of his day, even daunting Jung and Freud. Yes. Uh, hypnosis, look, let me see if I have it. This is something that Ospensky discovered. Ospensky went to Gurdjieff's house in Armenia, that is his family's house, and he found a picture on the wall of Gurdjieff before he became the kind of the great man, as it were. And uh, there it is. And he realized, oh, I see. He was a traveling hypnotist. <laughs> And he did, you know, various things. That's the picture that was on the wall. This is before Gurdjieff had really come on the scene, but he'd already knew some of the techniques and through hypnosis had developed certain abilities. Um, but I think that picture is pretty telling. It gives us an idea. <laughs> and just because I have good pictures of Gurdjieff, of course, Gurdjieff's driver's license in France. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. That is the real thing. Yes. <laughs> A mystery school master. You got to drive a car. You're going to need a license. Um, yeah. All right. What do you got? I want to make sure I fit this in. Mod Wiz said Spensky could uh, not walk on the wild side, and Gurdjieff <laughs> had a feral nature. Yeah. Adam Huglo said the way of the troll, and other people are saying the way <laughs> of the trickster. Would you? Yeah. Would you say uh, that mm. was his nature? Yeah, it's not interesting. Um, he, they call him the rascal sage, which is interesting. And I think that I've seen this enough in life that people who have these types of tendencies can do tremendous things. Um, so there's something, yeah, I think there's something in the nature of that, which is right on. I want to say this about Aspensky before I get to the, uh, I have a food for the moon quote. I want to read you. Um, Ospensky posthumously published In Search of the Miraculous. So he held all of that information, his whole experience, everything. He didn't try to cash in on anything with Gurdjieff, whatever. When he dies, the instructions are, here's my book, Fragments of an Unknown Teaching. Publish it. The thing is incredible because it catches Gurdjieff in his prime, 1915 to about 1922. And all of the incredible things happen there all in the teaching and it seems like this book you know becomes the foundation of what the Gurdjieff groups are about and everything else Gurdjieff was never able to do that himself I mean like I said meetings with remarkable Ben Beelzebub yeah they're they're interesting but in search of the miraculous is here's the teaching here's the guy here's the experience and um so that he was able to do but his own career really you know, he became basically unhappy. And I was reading some notes earlier from his secretary. It seems at the end of his life, he felt that he had um, taken a wrong turn by hanging on to the Gurdjieff system and not figuring out because he said there's something vital that Gurdjieff let out relating to the higher emotional center that makes the whole thing work. But he never released that particular secret. And so, you know, in not working with him and looking just by doing the system of attracting those mystery schools in to help me, somehow, you know, the payoff is 
that I spent all this time behind this system. So Ospensky, uh, through all the years of working with it, even though he feels like it's the great representative of reality, it seems like the work that he was doing before Gurdjieff becomes the thing he tries to return to at the end of his life. And this is interesting, the leaving out part, because Ospensky had come to a certain type of conclusion about Gurdjieff, which is that he was part of a mystery school. He was part of the Sarmung Brotherhood. He had the mysteries and he had all this kind of knowledge that Ospensky in all of his travels and through all of his study had never come across. But he felt that because of Gurdjieff's nature, that mystery school had cut off ties with Gurdjieff and that Gurdjieff was out there as a maverick experimenting here and there. Um, so you have to take that into consideration. It's quite interesting when you think about it, because I'm sure the mystery schools have their own experiments along that line, but he may have been sent out to do a particular thing and he wasn't able to do it for one reason or another. Um, and yet so much of that information that's been put out there between the two of them is vouchsafed really for all of humanity into this period, because in the middle of all that, you know, Bennett comes in with the transformation work based on both Gurdjieff and Ospensky. Uh, so at the end, uh, Ospensky seemingly despondent says, when they say, what should we do when you're gone? Cause he knows he has this illness and he says, you will find a new way. And they said, should we, what should we do with the Gurdjieff system? And he says, there is no system. So that is Ospensky's take. His interpretation at the end of the day was find, you're going to have to find a different way. That's interesting too. Um, but when we think about the things that were brought in to, you know, popular parlance for the two of them, uh, they transformed the entire esoteric search and they created a whole different category. Uh, so, you know, Ospensky may have felt he'd gone off the wrong way, but he couldn't work with Gurdjieff anymore. And he felt, you know, Gurdjieff was a tainted channel, as he put it. So there's something, there's some scrimmage, you know, there's, there's some, something that goes off rails there. And it wasn't brought to its full, um, completion. However, seemingly, interestingly enough, pulling victory out of defeat, Ospensky's In Search of the Miraculous gets published and it ignites humanity into all of these concepts. And um, one of the very interesting things in the book is the description over and over again of the moon. I'm going to read that now, and then we'll continue taking your questions, and we'll go for about another 20 minutes. Mm How's -hmm. that graph? Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist Show. This is Gurdjieff Saves the 21st Century. Mindfulness, the Enneagram, food for the moon, the fourth way. It's all here, and we are just now apprehending those realities. And when you see people walking around in the zombie trance, looking down at their phone, like there's some meaning there in that phone that isn't in their everyday life, then the Gurdjieff work shines and shines in a way that people in the 1930s couldn't really have any idea. They were, you know, rebuilding after the depression and it was just before World War II. So, you know, uh, the kind of zombie trance that we were going to get into lowered into over time by the time the technology hits, you know, then the words of Gurdjieff saying, well, we're getting more and more, humanity is becoming more and more mechanized and we're in a sleep type trance. And when we are in a sleep type trance, things get mechanical. And when things are mechanical, no civilization can flourish um, and no spirituality, no spiritual evolution can take place. So that's the work coming out of the mystery tradition of Gurdjieff. Um, and so the, you know, people wondering, you know, Bennett wondering, well, <laughs> exactly where did Gurdjieff get this? Or Ospensky saying, well, he was in the mystery school, but he you know, got thrown out or something. Whatever it happens to be, the teaching is spot on. 
when it comes to that. And we can see it around us at all times. And I got to tell you, when I think about Gurdjieff's uh, concept about self-remembering and being aware and the wheel of eyes and everything of this nature, and I see this addiction to uh, this trance of technology, and you know, you're talking to somebody who managed a tech magazine for a number of years, so I have no problems with technology. I enjoy it immensely, but uh, the dangers of it and the way that people are growing up with it, there seems to be a stagnation. And um, I think that we're, and we're in a real crisis in world affairs as in regards to this. So um, I'm going to read the Food for the Moon thing, but first, Mr. Olivia Europe. Okay, leading into the moon. Rico Thompson Thompson says the initiation centers have always recognized that mankind is enthralled to the moon, that ordinary men and women are sleeping under the influence of the lunar powers. Twice a month, the matrix control system opens its maws and draws in a torrent of emotional energy from all those susceptible to the lunar influence. The fundamental understanding is that we are an energy source for some form of interdimensional parasites. <laughs> Well, see, there's all kinds of theories about the moon. And, of course, the moon is so crucial. Um, but I think the things that I'm about to say that Gurdjieff said about it aren't too different to what you're, you're mentioning. And I think that, uh, you know, Steiner describes the moon coming out of the earth as this incredible trauma. And it's funny because... Um, Gurdjieff describes the same thing, you know, the kind of Atlantean period when the moon is leaving the earth. And as a result of that, we develop something he calls the Kunda buffer, which is this center inside of ourselves that doesn't allow us to see reality. And this becomes very important. I think uh, the system that's in In Search of the Miraculous that Ospensky describes that Gurdjieff developed has a category in there about buffers and how people operate with buffers on a number of different levels. When I mentioned uh, the accumulators also, this is interesting because he drew a schematic of one accumulator and another accumulator and then a central energy source. And every human being has that. And apparently on a regular basis, we lower... You know, we come to the end on one accumulator and we switch over to the other one. And then the other one builds up and that's how we operate. And then there's the life force center driving both of them. And supposedly people like yogis or people who do these amazing feats, Kundalini or astral projection, whatever it happens to be, they're operating on that central core. And so they've taken both of the accumulators down and they're working just directly with this. And that very fine energy uh, apparently creates all kinds of incredible results that we would regard as miracles or holy or whatever. The only problem is you have to know what you're doing because if you don't know what you're doing, that's, that's your actual life force. <laughs> so you can't bring that down to zero. And that's why those yogis spend all this time developing, bringing this down and to draw on that very essential high source energy. That's the whole Kundalini uh, third eye piece in a nutshell. Yes. Humphrey Gooch, what did Casey say about the moon? Um, a number of interesting things. He talked about incarnations on the moon, but not in a physical body, in a moon body. How about that? Um, Casey's giving us a vision there of the moon and its relationship to the earth. And, uh, there's always a powerful mystical element involved. It's interesting that in one reading, uh, for a woman who's very sensitive, uh, psychic nature, he says, never sleep directly in moonlight. So that's interesting and hard to explain, but that's what came to mind when you mentioned that. Food for the Moon uh, is an interesting piece that shows up in the middle, uh, right in the beginning of uh, Gurdjieff meeting Ospensky and joining in with his first groups. He's learning these concepts and they're coming in fast like a flood. 
and they're sort of igniting his imagination about all these things. But one of them he catches onto and he is fascinated by and he goes to is Gurdjieff's comments about the moon, which strike him as very different from everything else that he's heard in mystical texts, etc. cetera. Um, and here's what he has to say about it. The process of the growth and the warming of the moon is connected with life and death on the earth. Everything living sets free at its death a certain amount of energy that has animated it. This energy, or the souls of everything, living, plants, animals, people, is attracted to the moon as though by a huge electromagnet and brings to it the warmth and the life upon which its growth depends. That is the growth of the ray of creation. In the economy of the universe, nothing is lost, and a certain energy, having finished its work on one plane, goes to another. The souls that go to the moon, it's a weird term, this is Gurdjieff speaking directly to the group, the souls that go to the moon, possessing perhaps even a certain amount of consciousness and memory, find themselves there under 96 laws. In the conditions of mineral life, or to put it differently, in conditions from which there is no escape apart from a general evolution, in, in immeasurably long planetary cycles. By the way, Gurdjieff said that the Earth was under 48 of these laws. When you go to the moon, it's 96. Wow. Even more difficult, twice as difficult. In conditions from which there is no escape apart from the general evolution in immeasurably long planetary cycles, the moon is at the extremity, at the end of the world. It is the outer darkness in the Christian doctrine. The influence of the moon upon everything living manifests itself in all that happens on the earth. The moon is the chief, or rather the nearest, the immediate motive force of all that takes place in organic life on earth. All movements, all actions, manifestations of people, animals, plants depend upon the moon and are controlled by the moon. The sensitive film of organic life, which covers the earthly globe, is entirely dependent upon the influence of the huge electromagnet that is sucking out its vitality. Man, like every other living being, cannot in the ordinary conditions of life tear himself free from the moon. All his movements and consequently all his actions are controlled by the moon. If he kills another man, the moon does it. If he sacrifices himself, the moon does it also. All evil deeds, crimes, and actions, and even heroic exploits are the actions of ordinary, uh, as well as the actions of ordinary everyday life, are controlled by the moon. <laughs> um, so we're getting, you know, he's he's diming in here that this is quite the process uh, of the accumulation of power into the central body. So he's he's kind of leaving it out there and laying it on really heavy. Let's get just a little bit more, and then we'll go to the rest of your questions. Um, now, he's talking about the energy of the planets in the solar system. He says, the energy is collected and preserved in a huge accumulator situated on the Earth's surface. This accumulator is organic life on Earth. Organic life on Earth feeds the moon. Everything that is on the Earth, people, animal, plants, is food for the moon. Now, the moon is a huge living being feeding upon all that lives and grows in the earth. The moon could not exist without organic life on earth any more than organic life on earth could exist without the moon. In relation to organic life, the moon is a huge electromagnet. Again, that term, electromagnet, uh, Gurdjieff throwing in there. But, you know, we all know the tides are concerned with this conception, everything else, the moon goes back. There's still so much that we don't understand about the moon that only, like in terms of answers, exists in the mysteries, exists in uh, the kind of secret doctrine about these things. Otherwise, we're looking at a vaguely scientific point of view, which doesn't even know how the moon got to where it is. As a matter of fact, you know, uh, the main concept in science is, well, you know, someday it just smashed into the earth. <laughs> so we don't know, literally, on that level. You have to go deep into the mystery information to get a glimpse of what we're talking about. And then, you know, remember 
in dealing with, uh, not from the Gurdjieff work, but from Steiner's work, the whole concept of the eighth sphere and how it's misidentified as the moon. But the idea of these spheres and their influence and the things that are being developed, you know, um, it's quite fascinating because there's a whole planetary process that we're connected with, which doesn't come up in anything, you know, um, it doesn't come up in popular religion. It doesn't come up in science. It doesn't come up in philosophy. There's a gigantic piece linking astronomy and astrology to the processes of our everyday life, but it's a total missing chapter. We don't understand anything about it. And on a scientific level, they understand, well, you know, there's this movement, there's a black hole. We don't know why it's a black hole, but you know, so they, they have vague concepts about things. And then, um, when you, when you're looking at it from the point of view of traditional religion, they don't mention anything about the planets. So you, you need a different source in order to understand these things. You need some concept of the mysteries. And again, it's that information that is driven often underground. I remember the whole thing about uh, Gurdjieff and it's the whole what to do and how to do it. What to do is what the religions teach or spiritual attunement, whatever it happens to be, you know, love thy neighbor, turn the other cheek, whatever it is. But the how to do it is not so easy, right? Because if somebody slaps you on your cheek, you're liable to hit them before you even think of it. So how do you turn the other cheek, for example? That's a, a method. And so the how to do it stays underground, stays hidden. So when we get into some of these deeper mysteries, we can see why. Well, why is it underground? Why doesn't everybody know this? Um, it's because when it comes above ground, it's a threat to the prevailing order and they, you know, they burn the books as it were. What happened when Cortez came over here and the Mayans were like, Hey, <laughs> you want to know about Atlantis? It's all here in our books. They're like, no, bring your books over here in a big bonfire <laughs> and we'll get rid of that stuff for you. And we'll make your slaves and take your gold. How's that sound? So, um, you know, there has to be some, uh, you're not going to get what we'll get kind of very superficial answers in the orthodoxy around things of this nature. Yes. Miss Olivia zero infinity live says the moon protects the earth from all sorts of cosmic garbage that might otherwise destroy the living beings on the surface. Scarlet fire says the moon is the only object in the sol solar system that does not rotate. Very strange. Ghost Malone says John Lair said souls go to the moon to be recycled. And Cameron says Ingo Swan told us all about the moon. Well, this is the interesting thing because um, what do you do when there's ruins on the moon? Then what? <laughs> what does that suggest? Somebody's up there. Uh, so Ingo's story is quite interesting because he got drawn into a remote viewing project after doing government projects, but this one was supposedly a government project. And then the people, he didn't recognize them. And uh, the people who were showing up to bring him to these sessions were twins. They were blonde haired, blue eyed twins. Uh, so <laughs> they have him, remote viewing the moon and he's tapping in and he's saying, Oh, this huge developments here. My God, you know, there's towers, there's all kinds of stuff. And then he's like, Oh wait, there's something here. There's a telepath blocking me from seeing the rest of it. And they tell him, Oh wait, you've been spotted. Get the hell out of there now. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's a great deal. I think <laughs> with what Ingo was telling us there, Obviously, all is not as it appears on that. But I think if you go into um, the deep legends around the moon over time, we can see that our own evolution, uh, more than just physical evolution, but the whole evolution track, spiritual evolution track of humanity is linked up directly with the moon. I never see the moon negatively. It's just that we have to understand what its function is. Of course, all these things are for a good outcome, ultimately. 
by the way, I have a picture here of Gurdjieff at the end. And uh, it's very interesting because how did this kind of uh, stowaway <laughs> from the mystery schools, how did he do? Bringing forward this information, studying humanity and giving us the great secrets that he had studied and worked so hard to get, the incredible things he needed to do. Um, it's a great question, but I think he accomplished a great deal, in fact. And, you know, if we just kind of strip away the projection of Gurdjieff and all the rest of it, you just think about the incredible life journey of going in search of this stuff, landing in a mystery school, learning it all, coming out and trying to teach it, and um, having this incredible journey of doing it. And now here we are with part of that mystery school teaching and learning out here in public where it, you know, it was always banned or it was always repressed, but we have it, we have aspects of it. And uh, so then on one hand, we look at Gurdjieff and we say, how well did he do with all the things that the mystery schools gave him? And then we think to ourselves, wait a minute, how well have we done with all the information that's been handed out? Remember, a couple hundred years ago, that's the same information that would get you burned at the stake. So we're in a totally different dynamic, aren't we? Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist X Series 159. This is Gurdjieff Saves the 21st Century. Enneagram, Food for the Moon, the Fourth Way, the Gurdjieff Ospensky Bennett uh, teaching brought forward into transformation in this period. We're going to take a couple more of your questions and then we're off into the mysteries ourselves. Yes, what do you got? Trevor Stoltenberg, what's the connection between J.G. Bennett, the Subud movement, and Barack Obama? <laughs> there is. There's a, well, here's how that goes, which is um, Subud, there was an indication from Gurdjieff at the end of his life to Bennett that something big was going to happen that would be the next level of the mystery schools in the public. And when Pak Suba showed up, Pak Suba was a doctor and he learned this technique. Um, and the technique was something called the Ladihan. And it was this exchange of energy. And basically the way you can look at it is think about Reiki, really. So Reiki is a kind of a version of it. But this one was really extreme. People would claim all these incredible uh, effects from it. So it was really high voltage, as it were. And, you know, our friend Bennett was like, huh, I'm all in, I'm going for it. And he went and he studied with Suba and he was like, this must be it. But then weird things started to happen, which is people who were involved in Subud, a lot of people would come to it and they would have strange kind of, uh, you know, things happen to them. They become high strung. Um, and so what happened were there were some suicides around Subud and Ladihan, and it got some bad press as a result of that. But then also Bennett was like, oh, you know, I was too eager <laughs> involved in this. It is an incredible thing. And I believe in Pak Suba, but the Subud thing is not as worked out as the Gurdjieff thing was in terms of a transformational path. It's more of a, a thing that people have latched onto and everybody wants this spiritual energy that this guy can generate and there's a healing energy but unfortunately it sort of drives some people crazy or off the rails so um he got disturbed by it and withdrew from the whole thing a lot of high you know actresses actors um there were a lot of people involved in sabud in the 60s but what happens is um there's a you know barack obama's mother moves to Indonesia. And there she works with or is around a Ladihan group. And so there's always been a, a crisscross about how much did Pak Suba and Sabud and Ladihan have to do with Obama. Um, but I, I haven't been able to, you know, some people have gone pretty far out on the speculation lane. I, there's definitely something 
about, you know, Obama was certainly there at the same time that this was happening and the mother was fully aware of it and knew people who were in that movement. But I don't know how much further it goes than that. It could go, um, you know, knowing how much the mysteries are involved <laughs> in the political process, it could go very, very deep indeed for Barry Satoro, as we know. Uh, yes. What would, what would that entail? What do you think it, I mean, obviously there's healing energy. Would there be? No, I don't think there's anything sinister about Sabud. I think it's, um, you know, what's interesting is. Would it be initiatory in its nature? Would it be? It's very spiritual. Blessing? Yeah. You know, what's weird is, um, in fact, Pak Suba, if you read his materials, it's like, it's basically like a UFO gives it to him. <laughs> <laughs> you did a whole report on this. Didn't you? Yeah, although um, I have something that I've been meaning to do on Sabud. So we'll, we'll probably put together an entire episode on it. Um, it is very unusual. And Bennett was right in the heart of it, promoting it. As a matter of fact, I have him on a TV talk show um, talking about it and, and the great things that are involved with it. And it's only a year after that that he's going to be like, I don't want anything to do with it. Although, you know, there's nothing wrong with him or what he's trying to do, but obviously whatever's getting, you know, it, there's not a, enough checks and balances around it. And, uh, but people still swear by Pak Suba and the things that he brought out. I mean, there's something strange. There's a space connection <laughs> with Sabud and there's the weird Obama connection through his mother. So yeah, I mean, that is very interesting uh, I don't jump to the next level and say, well, he was Pak Suba's son or something, <laughs> mm -hmm. but um, I think it was around. Yeah, no question. Really good question. And uh, the book on Sabud by Bennett is very eye-opening. I have it. And uh, since we're getting into some interesting territory here, let me pull out the stalin Gurdjieff connection. Are you ready for this? Everyone, it is Dark Journalist X series. 159 Gurdjieff saves the 21st century Enneagram food for the moon. Fourth way revealed. We've gone deep, deep tonight into Gurdjieff and Ospensky in the fourth way. There's more to go with Beelzebub, of course, but uh, we'll save that for another episode. Look at this guy and look at that smile, huh? <laughs> Good old Stalin. Well, he could have been a sweater model for the <laughs> Russians, but. Instead, he became a psychopathic dictator. What do you know? Very interesting timelines there with Stalin or whatever possessed him. But here's the interesting thing. Recently in Russia, there was, believe it or not, a Gurdjieff exposed TV documentary in Russia. And um, <laughs> it revealed a lot of things that have been hanging out on the margins in relation to Stalin and Gurdjieff. I'm going to do this in reverse. In 1949, at the end of 49, Beelzebub's Tales to His Grandson come out, comes out, and uh, Stalin gets a copy very early. He's, he's dialed into it. And he reads it, and he has people make lists of the names that Gurdjieff uses. And he pulls out a couple of particular names. One of them I'm going to read here. And he says... Get Gurdjieff here now. And they come back and they say, yes, <laughs> great dictator, we'll do it. And then they're like, Gurdjieff just died. He passed away. And uh, so there's this whole account of Stalin trying to get Gurdjieff to explain to him what these names are doing in there. Now, um, the name, let's see, I'm going to read a little bit about this review of this. comes from a French, uh, no, it's a Russian blog. And um, I'll give a little more information about it. Now, um, some of it, some of the information about Stalin and Gurdjieff has been out there for a while. They went to the same school, apparently knew each other. And later that Stalin got very interested and tried to get Gurdjieff to work for his government. Now, we know that the czars tried to get Gurdjieff to work around the same time that they had Rasputin because Gurdjieff had the same reputation 
He's a healer. He's a psychic. He's all the rest. And um, what Bennett said was on the dossier that he got when he went to spy on Gurdjieff oh, as part of the British military was that he's a Russian agent. So this is how, uh, you know, they were like, watch out for everything he does. He's a Russian agent. So when he, you know, try to go to India and things like that. Uh, India wouldn't let Gurdjieff in because they thought he was a Russian agent because that's what the British were telling him. So there's all kinds of weird things about intrigues that go on there. Now, apparently one of the big breaks that happens with Ospensky and Gurdjieff is that um, Ospensky freaks out that Gurdjieff has been a spy for Russia and that he thinks that that's not worthy of a spiritual master or whatever. And so he flips, and that's the break that takes place there beyond all the personal uh, problems that happen between the two of them. So that could very well be the way that it's described. Um, but whatever, you know, unfortunately, when you're Rasputin, when you're Gurdjieff, uh, Aleister Crowley, <laughs> all of these guys get approached on one level or, or another. And if it suits their plans for what they're doing, they may act in some political capacity. Um, it could even be a patriotic thing, but nonetheless, uh, you know, there's a lot of questions that get raised. Now, there's also um, a thing in here about Gurdjieff's cousin who made all these death masks, and that was his specialty. And, you know, so all these famous people would come to him to make their death masks. And um, so the family has some interesting characters like that. But one of the things that they say about that cousin is that the Nazis, when they went to make those incredible swastika banners, that they used that cousin. So Gurdjieff's family shows up in an interesting fashion in some of this. Then, you know, like any television special or documentary, they might just go too far with some of it, but it's, it's throwing it out there. Um, but... There were a couple of interesting things in the review anyway, so I'm going to read them for you here, and then we'll take a couple more questions around. Sounds good. Okay, everyone. X-Series 159, Gurdjieff Saves the 21st Century. Okay, here's an excerpt from the review. Uh, the young Gurdjieff had experiences that led him to believe that there are somewhere guardians of the secret forbidden knowledge that can give unbelievable power over a man and humanity. He relates the story of an ancient Armenian capital, Anai, Gurdjieff found an ancient manuscript, which was part of the mysterious brotherhood of Sarmoon regarding a uh, residing in the far East. Um, they tell now the director tells a peculiar story about a train with money. It entered a tunnel, but it did not come out of it and said that Gurdjieff appeared to create some kind of mirage. So these are weird stories about <laughs> Gurdjieff's early life one of them relates to this train mirage thing, which sounds like, who's that guy, David Copperfield? He makes <laughs> the Statue of Liberty disappear. Um, okay, so there's there's some weird stories, urban legends about him. He then refers to Gurdjieff's cousin, the sculptor Sergei Murkarov, whose specialty was death masks. Uh, the director says that what Gurdjieff offered was the harmonic philo philosophical thinking an understanding, why are we here? Who are we? This is cosmic understanding of the world. And they go on to discuss the relationship between Gurdjieff and Stalin. In Tbilisi, they studied in the same seminary. This is actually true. And lived in the same house that belonged to an uncle of Gurdjieff. Stalin quit the seminary and skipped out without paying the rent. Mm -hmm. But that initial relationship between them is a fact, is what they say here. Now, uh, they definitely went to school and had at least some knowledge of each other. If you're in the same school, you don't necessarily <laughs> hang out with the other people in the school, but the fact that they were both there together and both kind of extraordinary, maybe they did. Um, Murkarov was academically trained, was received in Russian Orthodox circles. He was commissioned by wealthy people inside the Communist Party and was able to move with ease in masonry. Um, and so basically the upshot is that they're saying that this whole connection with Turkey that Gurdjieff had through this prince and all the stuff that Bennett spied on him for is related directly through this cousin who made the death mass. Later, they say that 
Stalin was after Gurdjieff because he wanted, he had heard that Gurdjieff went to the mystery schools and he wanted to use the mystery school techniques to set up a spy network. So uh, this is the weirdness and how weird the Stalin story gets. Now, I haven't watched the special, nor do I know if it's translated into English, but um, there's one last piece in here. Let's see. Right. In formulating a system, Gurdjieff took some components from mysticism, including notions about the nature of harmony, psychology, and the physical body. He focused his attention on psychology. Remember Spensky earlier. Um, and what's interesting, I think, that they're saying here is that um, because Gurdjieff was obsessed with this, Stalin, in tracking him, was aware of the things that he had learned and tried to recruit him to do different things for the Russian government. So this gets interesting, and I'm going to be interested to see if they dig out anything new. Um, so then they say that uh, people have maintained that Gurdjieff held a secret power over the leaders of political dictatorships. Some have said that Hitler, in selecting the swastika as a symbol for the Nazi party, uh, did it because Gurdjieff had selected it. Gurdjieff left behind a trial of unexpected tales uh, and so on they go for it. So they really kind of throw Gurdjieff into everything there. But what I do find I interesting- I they blamed Blavatsky for that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the only thing I think is interesting is that at the end of his life, Stalin's looking for Beelzebub's tale. And in the earlier portion of his life, he is in the same school. So he remembers Gurdjieff at least. But uh, he may have tried to recruit him to work with him to develop this network, but there's no evidence anywhere that uh, Gurdjieff did anything for the Russian government. So it's, it's a, but it is, you know, it, it leaves open the question. Uh, and I would say that, so what they say at the end is the thesis of the documentary to the extent that it has a consistent one is that Gurdjieff was something of an agent whose life and work, if understandable at all, may be viewed in the light of political philosophies, the psychological theories and intrigues of his day and the constant and the contents of Eastern Europe. Um, what's interesting is that, um, you know, Nicholas Rorick, who was over here, uh, who's an artist and kind of has a similar, kind of similar background to Gurdjieff, but he's Russian and it is FDR and his VP, Henry Wallace. And Wallace is a theosophist, and FDR, they're writing letters back and forth about how do we get in touch with the masters and stuff. I mean, it's the president of the United States, you know. Uh, and Warwick says, you know, Shambhala is right there in Central Asia, while Central Asia is where all of the mystery schools that Gurdjieff went to, uh, you know, that's the location that he indicated, although he also indicated Egypt and uh, Iran. So, you know, there, there were political connections to people who were involved in mysticism and uh, they still have the Rorick Art Museum in New York City today. Mm -hmm. All right, Miss Olivia, you're up. Adam Huglo, uh, DJ, remind us of the Gurdjieff Crowley meeting. <laughs> well, uh, this is factual, which is that uh, the Priory, like I said, uh, when it was set up, it was a kind of a network of people who were aware of it. And there's a whole thing about FDR going there for healing because he was part of a group in New England uh, after he suffered all these effects from polio and things that were very concerned with kind of holistic uh, things, you know, that you could swim and you know, get massage and uh, do all these different things in order to uh, get your ability to walk back. So FDR had the money and he heard of this healer over there in France who was doing this and this was Gurdjieff. And so he went there to the Priory. There's enough about that. Interestingly enough, <laughs> Crowley goes there uh, detoxing from heroin, basically. He's heard about it and he wants to go to this mystical place to do it. And uh, he basically has spent a week there, but he, the first time that he encounters Gurdjieff um, Gurdjieff sees him talking to some of the children and saying, Hey, you can be my little demons or something like that. <laughs> and that's it for Gurdjieff. <laughs> and, uh, so Gurdjieff, you know, ejects him from 
uh, the Priory. And Crowley says, you know, what have I done to offend thee, you know, and all this kind of stuff. But then he's like, don't tempt me, you know, with my powers and everything else. And there's sort of a standoff between them. But the upshot is just that Crowley gets out of there. What's interesting to me is that um, when I hear about Crowley's spying work, I wonder if Crowley wasn't there spying on Gurdjieff for somebody. <laughs> Maybe Churchill. Yes. What do you got? Uh, you know, that reminded me, I, I can't remember what it is, but some Lady Gaga calls her fans something like little demons. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wanted to show you that this is rare. And, you know, I'm big on trying to find the photographs that really tell the story. This is Gurdjieff. Uh, First of all, these are the, the dances on the Enneagram. And this is what they did with the symbol of the Sarmung, which is they had the dancers do the movements on the Sarmung. And Gurdjieff said each dance, each performance contained a thousand books for those who could read the alphabet of the language they were using. Um, and those sacred dances, I'll tell you, I've, I've been around people who've done them, who try to teach me how to do them. This was this is years ago, you know, uh, right after college. And, um, you know, I did them enough to get some sense of what's taking place there. And I'll tell you, there's something very, very unusual about them. So there's no regular playbook for how to do Gurdjieff movements. You, you know, it's some groups do it and, um, they are strange. The only thing that I can remember about it is it seemed like after you did them for a while, your relationship, like the time part seemed to change. So if you were doing that stuff for, you know, I don't know, a half hour, you would only feel like a couple of minutes had gone by. So there was some, there's something very unusual about the movements. Now here's the shot. It's obviously a double exposure, but then again, you know, <laughs> could be Gurdjieff's astral body. There is Gurdjieff simultaneously bending over here to show them the movements, but that's him there in a standing pose originally. So that double exposure kind of, I think. So cool. <laughs> Take a look. Love it. Unbelievable, if you can imagine. Um, so those are the types of things that, you know, just when you think you've seen the last interesting photo around the Gurdjieff work, lo and behold, um, I mentioned to you that uh, people like Huxley and you know, some of the great intellects of the day in France and in the UK would come to Gurdjieff and they would be like, you know, I want to meet Gurdjieff and talk with him all night about these theories. And he would say, let's go and paint <laughs> the walls of the Priory or something. So uh, at midnight in the middle of this kind of discourse or whatever, he invites all of these people who've come over, including Huxley and others to now that we've talked a little philosophy let's go paint at the priory and there he is doing it so there's something always working Gurdjieff's always taking himself out of that mental space and going back into a physical one this is an important thing because um there's obviously some attention and some quality of attention that's required uh in the mysteries and you know so here's Gurdjieff saying you guys are great theoretical minds, but uh, let's let's go and focus on the task together. And that uh, not only is a great affront to a number of these people and they take off or whatever, but some of them stick around and they do it with them. There's one wonderful story about this student who's working with Gurdjieff and uh, he says, well, the whole day he had us build this incredible thing where we all had to arrange these stones in a particular fashion we created this kind of wall of rocks and it was an incredible thing. And the next day he said, all right, let's just assemble it. And they were all disappointed because they loved this thing they'd created. And, you know, the whole thing was about them working together. The outcome, the wonderful thing, you know, <laughs> it was the energy. It was the creative energy of them working together that did it. And it didn't require, you know, having this, great wall of rocks after the fact to point to. This is very interesting. You see it over and over again, the setup of something, the destruction of it. And um, that's also true in terms of the Institute for the Harmonious Development, the group that he developed um, with Ospensky in Essentucky. 
they were going to an amazing, they were making great strides. They were doing all these things in about a year and a half in, he said, you know what? That's it. No more work. And this is when Ospensky was like, you know, he, there's something going wrong here. He, this guy's playing games. <laughs> like we're all doing so well. Why is he pulling this now and pulling the plug in the whole thing? So, you know, there, there's some quality there. there. There's still some mystery to the methods that are involved. And I think it opens up a great deal of questions. And with that, Ms. Olivia, we'll take one more question and you're in. I'm just going to comment on out. what you just said. A light weaver makes a feature film, says wax on, wax off. And <laughs> right. Sovereign Brian <laughs> wow, says the true? point of the work is the work. Julia Cameron. Ah. Okay. So, all right. I guess the final question um, is, Hizzo, what are the top three books you would recommend on this topic? There are no books that can capture the master of the mysteries. No, um, the, <laughs> the books, of course, In Search of the Miraculous has the story as told by Ospensky. And, you know, it's one of your favorite books of all time. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. It's so fascinating. And Gurdjieff, when he got it, this is after Ospensky died. He was like, I can't believe this. This is the most incredible book. And he, he tells exactly what happened. So think about Gurdjieff and the storminess of their relationship and him being so grateful that uh, Spensky went to the letter of, of exactly what happened. A um, couple of final quotes. Actually, it's this one I wanted to get to, which is in the Bennett Transformation book. Uh, and <laughs> it actually, it, there's a question that came up earlier about Spensky versus Gurdjieff and how they did things. Spensky's negative attitude towards religion had a profound effect upon me. And I did not begin to recover my religious faith until I returned to Gurdjieff in 1948. Only now do I see how significant this was for me. I refer to it here to illustrate the difficulty in which any inexperienced and naive seeker is placed when he meets with someone whose knowledge and powers are clearly far beyond his own. Where the teacher does not ask for faith, but on the contrary demands that his pupils should accept nothing that they have not verified in their own experience, the temptation to take that one does verify, to take what one does verify in this way as a final truth is overwhelming. Let me read that last part again. The temptation to take what one does verify in this way as a final truth is overwhelming. To Ospensky, I owe an abiding belief that remains with me to this day, that to gain anything of value, one must be prepared to pay for it, Though my understanding of what payment really means has changed profoundly, I gained a wrong notion of what is meant by super effort. Ospensky's own examples of walking 20 miles in a blizzard evoke the picture of a heroic action requiring one to drive oneself to the limit of endurance. Um, this picture was painted on a prepared canvas, and he talks here about how his uh, mother had set him up saying, you know, only through suffering can you gain anything, like no pain, no gain. He said, the immense debt I owe to my mother for her example and precept that fixed in my mind that slothfulness destroys us, that tolerance is one of the best virtue, far outweighs the disadvantage of having labored for 60 years under the illusion that the unpleasant is better for us than the pleasant. I think that that kind of um, <laughs> realization, shall we say, coming from Bennett is something we need to keep in mind also, which is there's a kind of a <clears throat> a corrective in all this, which is, you know, don't leave the world, the world will leave you kind of thing when you are, you know, kind of taking the world and moving it back and not being so vested in the outside everyday world. But also sometimes when that happens, people throw out the very best things that they enjoy. And here is... Bennett saying at the end of his life, look, you know, you do, you know, no pain, no gain. You do have to uh, earn the things, but also don't, you know, do it with a smile, basically. And I think that's an absolutely crucial lesson. The other book uh, I'd recommend, of course, is Meetings with Remarkable Men. And then Witness is the Bennett book, which, which is kind of a good intro, right? Well, it's fantastic because remember, you know, he's the one. He's kind of like George Harrison working with uh, 
Paul McCartney and John Lennon, like you, you're the one who's able to observe these incredible kind of super personalities, Gurdjieff and Ospensky going at it for 40 years. And then here you are in the middle, this kind of, you know, stately British guy, and you have to kind of, uh, learn, take what they've done and then build upon it. And, you know, you're not the kind of dynamic figure that they were, but you've, you've taken in all the knowledge. So, you know, everything and you're able to kind of come at it in a different way. Uh, is there a quote from witness? Let's see. Oh yeah. It's interesting because, um, after he does the movements for the first time, this is actually rather interesting. Here's his description of what happened. Suddenly I was filled with the influx of immense power. My body seemed to have turned into light. I could not feel its presence in the usual ways. There was no effort, no pain, no weariness, not even any sense of weight. I felt an intense gratitude towards Gurdjieff and his musical director, De Hartmann. But they had quietly gone off, having dismissed the class and left me alone. My own state was blissful beyond anything I'd ever known. It was quite different than the ecstasy of sexual union, for it was altogether free and detached from the body. It was exultation in that faith that can move mountains. This is Bennett's description of doing the Gurdjieff movements. It's quite remarkable. Uh, and since they mentioned a Hartman there, I'm going to close this, which is a real funny, humbling story. De Hartman is basically like, you know, he's, he's the director of the conservatory, um, in Moscow. <laughs> and, you know, he's just a well-known, incredible, um, musician who's traveled and, and done all these incredible things. And then he joins in with the Gurdjieff movement and Gurdjieff has music as this gigantic component because he has all the temple music that he's uh, had. And if you've ever listened to it, it's incredibly powerful. But what's interesting is Gurdjieff in order, you know, when he says, you, do, you can just do the music, you don't have to be the student. And DeHartman says, no, I want to be the student. I want to learn everything. And he says, okay, here's what you have to do. You have to go in front of the conservatory and you have to beg for money. <laughs> so the Hartman goes out there, you know, he talks with his wife. He's like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to do this. And he said, the hardest thing I ever had to run of the conservatory and ask for money as the people were going in, you know, with fur coats and all dressed up. And they're the director that they knew of this conservatory. And he's out there begging for money. So this is the kind of, um, you know, dismissing of the ego that was necessary in order in his case i don't know if it would have been the true for everyone but in de hartman's case there was some sense of the pageantry of the whole thing which needed to be stripped away and i remember this uh story with um ledbetter and blavatsky actually it's interesting because she made him on this ship they had done this ship together and she made him walk up and down the deck of the ship in front of all these important people that he knew holding a bedpan. <laughs> so again, there, you know, there's the stripping down of the ego in order to get to something bigger, but, um, that's pretty hardcore. <laughs> and with that, Miss Olivia. Okay. I got a bunch of super chatters today. Fantastic. I am I and I, Eurythmy is fun, Boba the Clown, Global Atlantis, Karen Carpenter, Zach Boyles, Norman Smith, Debbie McAdoo, John Folden, Woo Woo, Stacey Conger, Volcanelli, Jay Parsons, Calvin F. Center, Terry Doherty, the Philip K. Dick Film Festival, Sun Hero, Erica Swenson Elliott, Jenny Runco, Helena Wilcox, Janie, Bo Krills, Adam Huglow, Copernicus, Doyle Wayne, Brian Berner, Shazam, and Ruth A. Thank you so much for your generous super chats. Incredible. Thank you so much for your support. It helps us to do what we do here on the show for you. And uh, to all our subscribers and supporters, we really appreciate it. We couldn't bring you these uh, incredible reports. And uh, I will leave you with the quote from the original poster of the Gurdjieff Institute, which is, to know, to understand, to be. Uh, that I think really says a lot. And, uh, it's very interesting. You know, we've talked a lot about Gurdjieff and his, his different sides and everything, but how extraordinary the things that he brought forward and the methods for 
uh, humanity, spiritual development contained in that work um, that drew in so many people from so many different things to learn the incredible uh, knowledge and wisdom he had gleaned through his searches for this higher knowledge and the idea of mystery schools and that direct interaction with the mystery schools, not as some ascended master in a lofty plane, but literally working um, there. And, you know, it's funny because the ascended master in the lofty plane is directly connected to the other work. They're both part and parcel of the same thing. Um, but the Gurdjieff way was, you know, let's kick the fantasy out. All people are fantasizing into these different levels of Nirvana without doing the work on the ground. And the wonderful thing uh, about the Gurdjieff work is, is that is really grounded stuff. And yet it contains all the mysteries. It contains the knowledge of Atlantis. It is the esoteric uh, Christianity. It has the mysteries and it has um, the deeper concepts of that hidden reality behind the veil of everyday reality that we deal with on a daily basis. And just have that hint, that sense that there's something spiritual knocking on the door behind all of that. And uh, so I hope I, I got a little bit of that out there for you tonight. I'll do a couple of shout outs as we go. Go to St. Petersburg if you're ready. I like that. <laughs> they say it's the most beautiful city. I can imagine. So dreamy. DJ. <laughs> Indeed. This is, there's a lot of dream in there. Thanks for the new material and insight, DJ and Olivia. Karen Carpenter. Fantastic. Black Zionist, glorious. I love mystery schools, salt mm -hmm. of the earth. I know Gigi is out there doing a great job. By the way, um, <laughs> Gigi's work, uh, she's been doing incredible, amazing things. And Killing she, it. She did a remarkable uh, entry, which was uh, fascinating on Twitter, actually. And it was this exposition about a vision she had of a society that had destroyed itself on Mars. This was incredible uh, stuff, and I highly recommend people check it out. And Gigi, <laughs> we're going to talk about that one. Uh, thank you, DJ and Olivia, and Ideas from Great Talk as usual. Whew. Melissa's mind. I know Kate's out there. It's great to see you. Uh, I have been drawn to the nine muses lately. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. Well, you can feel there's something, you know, the mystical is opening up right now. And uh, that's always a good thing. What did Casey called it? The thinning of the veils between the spiritual world and the physical world. I think we're getting a sense of that now. Martin Taylor, Ruth A, Stella Rendition, Chop Wood Carry Water. <laughs> yeah. Well, I went through those, those different things. Let's see. Did I explain everything on my list? I guess I did. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, accumulators. We did go over that. Magnetic center. This is an interesting one. And real quickly, it's enough, you know, books and things, they only go so far. It's true. But what they do is they cultivate a magnetic center that will magnetize more and more experiences our way. That's the value there. So when someone says, oh, it's only a book or whatever. Well, no, if it's, it's opening uh, a space in our minds. And after all, you know, I know some pretty good books. <laughs> <laughs> we got one more DJ Friday night before the eclipse. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Uh, isn't the eclipse the end of the month or is that? No, there's two. Oh, that's right. It's the 14th is the other one. Yes. Whoa. Well, next week is Friday the 13th. Watch out. Mm -hmm. Watch out. That's much better than, uh, you know, the October 4th surprise. Remember everybody was super into that. <laughs> the emergency broadcast system. Wow. Uh, Shazam is out there. Silent Murmur, Space Ghost, Friday the 13th. Exactly. That is some hardcore action. We will see you all next week. And uh, we may see you before. Bobby is doing the big, big announcement now on October 9th in Philadelphia. This is going to be something for the record books. Just incredible uh, him announcing that he's going independent. And we can't wait to see what he has to say and what party he's decided to go with. Just straight independent. Is it is he independent running on the libertarian ticket? Is it pure independent? What's going on there? We're going to find out. And uh, he also is going to be um, 
up here in Boston, is what I heard at the end of uh, August, uh, no, October, excuse me. So we're looking at uh, some very, very interesting. No, Gigi Young cover Saturn. Um, Go to ggyoung.com and find out. This is, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she covers a lot of the planets. Uh, heavy, heavy dude. May, uh, Najat Madri, mind expanded. There we go. Uh, okay. Sovereign Brihan. <laughs> it's great to see a Doyle Wayne. Fantastic crowd out there tonight. We'll see you all next week. And remember, never let it be forgot. Uh, <laughs> once there was a Camelot. Thank you, Sherry Ann. We love you too. Templars. Hey, you're reading my mind. Undestroyer. I like it. We'll see you all next week. Never let it be forgot once there was a Camelot. And there can be again. Look at Bobby Go. Go, Bobby Go. <laughs> we'll see you all next week. And um, keep in mind the, uh, the, the fruits of the mysteries and the Gurdjieff work tonight. We'll see y'all later. God bless. Have a fantastic weekend.